Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and enjoy your audiobook. Chapter 8 King Granis of Trocinet was a man thin, grizzled and angular, abrupt of manner and notably terse until events went awry, whereupon he singed the air with expletives and curses. He had greatly desired a son and heir, but Queen Bodile gave him four daughters in succession, each born to the sound of Granis's furious complaints. The first daughter was Larissa, the second Athel, the third Fernist, the fourth Byron. Then Bodil went barren, and Granis's brother, Prince Arbimet, became heir presumptive to the throne. Granis's second brother, Prince Ospero, a man of complicated personality and somewhat frail constitution, not only lacked ambition to the throne, but so disliked the flavor of court life, with its formality and artificial circumstances, that he stayed almost reclusively at his manor watershade, at the center of the sealed, Trocinet's inner plain. Ospero's spouse, Aenor, had died bearing his single son, Ilus, who in due course grew to be a strong, broad-shouldered lad of middle stature, taut and sinewy rather than massive, with ear-length blonde-brown hair and gray eyes. Watershade occupied a pleasant place beside Janglin Water, a small lake with hills to the north and south, and the sealed stretching away to the west. Originally, Watershade had served to guard the sealed, but three hundred years had passed since the last armed excursion through its gates, and the defenses had fallen into a state of picturesque disrepair. The armory was silent except for the forging of shovels and horseshoes, the drawbridge had not been raised within memory. The squat round towers of Watershade stood half in the water, half on the shore, with trees overhanging the conical tiled roofs. In the spring blackbirds flocked above the marsh, and crows wheeled in the sky, calling caw, 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 across far distances. In the summer, Bees droned through the mulberry trees, and the air smelled of reeds and water-washed willow. At night, cuckoos cried in the forest, and in the morning brown trout and salmon struck at the bait almost as soon as it touched the water. Ospero, Eilis, and their frequent guests took supper outdoors on the terrace and watched many a glorious sunset fade over jangling water. In fall, the leaves turned color and the storehouses became chock-full with the yields of harvest. In winter, fires burned in all the fireplaces and the white sunlight reflected in diamond sparkles from Janglin water, while the salmon and trout lay close to the bottom and refused to strike at bait. Ospro's temperament was poetic rather than practical, he took no great interest either in events at the royal palace Meraldra, nor the war against Leoness. His bent was that of the scholar and antiquarian. For the education of Eilis he brought savants of high repute to Watershade. Eilis was instructed in mathematics, astronomy, music, geography, history, and literature. Prince Ospero knew little of martial techniques and delegated this phase of Eilis's education to Tonsi, his bailiff, a veteran of many campaigns. Eilis learned the use of bow, sword, and that recondite art of the Galician bandits, knife-throwing. This use of the knife, stated Tonsi, is neither courteous nor knightly. It is, rather, the desperado's resource, a ploy of the man who must kill to survive the evening. The thrown knife suffices to a range of ten yards. Beyond, the arrow excels. But in cramped conditions, a battery of knives is a most comfortable companion. Again, I prefer the small sword to the heavy equipment favored by the mounted knight. With my small sword, I will maim a full-armored man in half a minute, or kill him if I choose. It is the supremacy of skill over brute mass. Here, lift this two-hander, strike at me. Eilis dubiously hefted the sword. 
I fear that I might cut you in two parts. Stronger men than you have tried, and who stands here to tell about it? So swing with a will! Isla struck out. The blade was deflected. He tried once more. Tonsi wrenched, and the sword flew from Eilis's hands. Once more, said Tonsi. See how it goes? Flick, slide, off, away. You may drive down the weapon with all your weight. I interpose, I twist. The sword leaves your grasp. I stab where his armor gaps. In goes the sword, and out comes your life. That is a useful skill, said Eilis, especially against our chicken thieves. Ah! You will not keep to Watershade all your days, not with the land at war. Leave the chicken thieves to me. Now, to proceed. You are sauntering along the back streets of Avalon. You step into a tavern for a cup of wine. A great lummox claims that you have molested his wife. He takes up his cutlass and comes at you. So now, with your knife, draw and throw, all in a single movement. You advance, pull your knife from the villain's neck, wipe it on his sleeve. If, in fact, you have molested the dead churl's wife, bid her be gone. The episode has quite dampened your spirit. But you are attacked from another side by another husband. Quick! So the lesson proceeded. At the end, Tonsi said, well, I consider the knife a most elegant weapon. Even apart from its efficacy, there is beauty in its flight. As it cleaves hard to its target, there is a spasm of pleasure as it strikes home, deep and true. In the springtime of his eighteenth year, Eilis rode somberly forth from Watershade, never looking over his shoulder. The road took him beside the marshes which bordered the lake, across the sealed, and up through the hills to Green Man's Gap. Here Eilis turned to look back across the sealed. Far in the distance, beside the glimmer of jangling water, a dark blot of trees concealed the squat towers of Watershade. Eilis sat a moment in contemplation of the dear familiar places he was leaving behind, and tears came to his eyes. Abruptly he reined his horse about, rode through the tree-shrouded gap, and down Rundle River Valley. Late in the afternoon he glimpsed the Lear ahead, and shortly before sunset arrived at Hag Harbor under Cape Hayes. He went directly to the Sea Coral Inn, where he was well known to the landlord, and so was provided a good meal and a comfortable chamber for the night. In the morning he rode westward along the coast road, and by early afternoon arrived at the city Domris. He paused on the heights overlooking the city. The day was windy, the air seemed more than transparent, like a lens transmitting minute detail with clarity. Hob Hook, with a beard of foaming surf along its outer face, surrounded the harbor. At the base of Hob Hook stood Castle Miraldra, the seat of King Granis, with a long parapet extending to a lighthouse at the end of the hook. Originally a watchtower, Miraldra across the ages had been conjoined to an amazing complex of additions. Halls, galleries, a dozen towers of apparently random mass and height. Eilis rode down the hill, past the Peleus, a temple sacred to Gaia, where a pair of twelve-year-old maidens in white kirtles tended a sacred flame. Eilis rode through the town, the hooves of his horse suddenly loud on the cobbled way, past the docks, where a dozen ships were moored, past narrow-fronted shops and taverns, then out on the causeway to Castle Miraldra. The outer walls loomed high above Eilis, they seemed almost unnecessarily massive, and the entrance portal, flanked by a pair of barbicans, seemed disproportionately small. Two guards, wearing the dress maroon and gray of Miraldra, with polished silver helmets and bright silver cuirasses, stood with halberds tilted at parade rest. From the barbican, Eilis was recognized. Heralds blew a fanfare. The guards jerked the halberds into the erect salute position as Eilis passed through the portal. In the courtyard, Eilis dismounted and gave his horse over to a groom. Sir Esty, the portly seneschal, coming to meet him, performed a gesture of surprise. 
Prince Eyeless, have you come alone without retinue? By preference, Sir Esty, I came alone. Sir Esty, who was notorious for his aphorisms, produced yet another comment upon the human condition. Extraordinary that those who command the perquisites of place are those most ready to ignore them. It is as if the blessings of providence are specious, and notable only in their absence. Ah, well, I refuse to speculate. You are well, I trust, and enjoying your own perquisites? To the fullest, I have, you must know, this deep-seated fear that were I to neglect one of my little privileges, Providence might become peevish and whisk them away. Come now, I must see to your comfort. The king is away to Oddlemouth for the day. He inspects a new vessel which is said to be swift as a bird. He signaled to a footman. Take Prince Eyeless to his chamber, see to his bath, and provide him garments suitable for the court. Late in the afternoon, King Granis returned to Meraldra. Eyeless met him in the Grand Hall. The two embraced. And how goes the health of my good brother Ospro? He ventures seldom from Watershade. The outer air seems to bite at his throat. He tires easily and goes to hard gasping, so that I fear for his life. All his years he has been frail. In any case, you seem sound enough. Sir, you also seem to enjoy the best of health. True, lad, and I will share with you my little secret. Every day at this very hour I take a cup or two of good red wine. It enriches the blood, brightens the gaze, sweetens the breath, and stiffens the frontal member. Magicians search high and low for the elixir of life, and they already hold it in their hands, if only they knew our little secret. Eh, lad? And Granis clapped Eyeless on the back. Let us invigorate ourselves. With pleasure, sir. Granis led the way into a parlor hung with banners, escutcheons, and trophies of war. A fire blazed on the hearth, Granis warmed himself while a servant poured wine into silver cups. Granis waved Eyeless to a chair and settled himself into a chair beside the fire. I summoned you here for a reason. As a prince of the blood, it is time that you acquainted yourself with affairs of state. The surest fact of this precarious existence is that one may never stand static. In this life, everyone walks on ten-foot stilts. He must move and hop and cause an agitation. Otherwise, he topples. Fight or die, swim or drown, run or be trampled. Granis drank down a cup of wine at a gulp. The placidity here at Meraldra, then, is no more than an illusion? Eilis suggested. Granis gave vent to a grim chuckle. Placidity? I know none of it. We are at war with Leoness and wicked King Casimir. It is the case of a small stopper holding back the contents of a ton. I will not recite the number of ships patrolling the Leoness coast. That number is a war secret, which Casimir's spies would be glad to learn, just as I would be glad to learn the number of Casimir's spies. They are everywhere, like flies in a barn. Just yesterday I hanged a pair, and their cadavers dangle high on Semaphore Hill. Naturally, I employ spies of my own. When Casimir launches a new ship, I am notified, and my agents set it afire while it lies at dock, and Casimir gnashes his teeth to the gum. So goes the war, at a stalemate until the sluggish King Audrey sees fit to intervene. And then? And then? Battle and blood, sinking ships, burning castles. Casimir is astute and more flexible than he might seem. He risks little unless the gain is great. When he could not strike at us, his thoughts went to the Ulflands. He tried to suborn the Duke of Vale Evander. The ploy failed. Relations between Casimir and Carfilio are now, at best, correct. So what will he do next? King Granis performed a cryptic gesture. Ultimately, if we hold him off long enough, he must make peace with us, at our terms. Meanwhile, he struggles and squirms, and we try to read his mind. 
We puzzle over the dispatches of our spies who look at the world as it must appear from the parapets of Hadian. Well, enough for now of plots and intrigue. Your cousin Truin is somewhere at hand, a stern and earnest young man, but worthy, or so I hope, since one day, if events pursue their normal course, he will be king. Let us step into the dining hall, where no doubt we will discover more of this noble Velaspa. At supper, Eilis found himself seated beside Prince Truin, who had grown to be a burly, darkly handsome young man, a trifle heavy in the face, with dark round eyes separated by a long patrician nose. Truin dressed with care, in a style consonant with his rank. Already he seemed to anticipate the day when he would become king, which would be upon the death of his father Arbimet, if Arbimet indeed succeeded Granus as king. Ordinarily, Eilis refused to take Truin seriously, thus vexing Truin and incurring his heavy disapproval. On this occasion, Eilis restrained his levity that he might learn as much as possible, and Truin was more than ready to instruct his bucolic cousin. Truly, said Truin, it is a pleasure to see you down from Watershade, where time goes like a dream. We have little to startle us, agreed Eilis. Last week a kitchen maid went to pull greens in the garden and was stung by a bee. That was the most notable event of the week. Things go differently at Miraldra, I assure you. Today we inspected a great new ship, which we hope will augment our power and cause Casimir a canker. Did you know that he wants to ally with the Scar and turn them against us? It seems an extreme measure. Exactly so, and Casimir may not dare so greatly. Still, we must prepare for any eventuality, and this has been my point of view in the councils. Tell me about the new ship. Well, its design comes from the seas under Arabia. The hull is wide at the deck and narrow at the water, so that it is very easy and stable. There are two short masts, each supporting a very long yard at its middle point. One end of the yard is brought down to the deck, the other lifts high to catch the upper wind. The ship should move at speed even in light airs, in any direction whatever. There will be catapults, fore and aft, and other contrivances to foil the scar. As soon as possible, after shakedown, mind you now, this is secret information, the king has required that I undertake a diplomatic mission of great importance. At the moment I can say no more. What brings you to Meraldra? I am here at King Granis's command. For what purpose? I'm not sure. Well, we shall see, said Truin rather grandly. I will put in a word for you during my next conference with King Granis. It may help your prospects, and certainly can't hurt. That is good of you, said Eilis. On the following day, Granis, Truin, Eilis, and several others rode out from Meraldra, through Domris, then two miles north along the shore, to an isolated shipyard in the estuary of the Tumbling River. The group passed through a guarded gate, then walked along a trestle to a cove hidden from the sea by a bend of the river. Granis told Eilis, We attempt secrecy, but the spies refuse to oblige us. They come over the mountains to swarm among the shipwrights. Some come by boat, others think to swim. We only know of the ones we capture, but it is a good sign that they keep coming, which tells us something of Casimir's curiosity. There is the vessel itself. The Saracens call this type a felucca. Notice how low she floats. The hull is shaped like a fish and eases through the water without stirring awake. The riggers are now stepping the masts. Granis pointed to a pole hanging from a derrick. The mast is timberline spruce, which is light and resilient. Yonder lie the yards, which are built of spruce poles, scarfed, glued, and seized with iron wire and pitch to make a very long spar tapered at each end. There are no better masts or yards on the face of the earth, and in a week we shall put them to test. It will be named Smadra, after the Bithni Skazian goddess of the sea. 
Let us go aboard. Grannis led the way to the after cabin. We are not so commodious as on a merchantman, but the quarters suffice. Now, sit you two yonder. Grannis waved Eilis and Truin to a bench. Steward, bring Sir Famet here, and you may also give us refreshment. Grannis seated himself at the table and inspected the two young men. Truin, Eilis, listen now with all four of your ears. You are presently to make a voyage aboard the Smatra. Ordinarily, a new ship would be indulged with careful sea trials and all its parts tested. We shall still do so, but very hastily. Sir Famet entered the cabin, a sturdy, white-haired man with a face chiseled from rough stone. He gave a laconic greeting to Grannis and seated himself at the table. Grannis continued his exposition. I have had recent advice from Leoness. It appears that King Casimir, writhing and casting about like a wounded snake, has sent a secret mission to Skagain. He hopes for the use of a Scar fleet, if only to protect a landing of Leoness troops on Trossanet. The Scar so far have committed themselves to nothing. Neither, of course, trusts the other. Each would want to emerge with advantage. But evidently, Trossanet faces a grave danger. If we are defeated, so go the Elder Isles, either to Casimir, or worse, to the Scar. Truin said in a portentous voice, That is menacing news. It is indeed, and we must take countermeasures. If the Smadra behaves as we hope, six new hulls go on the ways at once. Second, I hope to bring pressure, both military and diplomatic, to bear against Casimir, though without any great optimism. Still, the effort can do no harm. To this end, as soon as possible, I will send the Smadra with envoys first to Dahout, Blaylock, and Pomperl, then Godelia, and finally South Ulfland. Sir Famet will command the voyage. You, Eilis, and you, Truin, shall be his aides. I intend that you make this voyage not for your health, nor personal satisfaction, nor the enhancement of your vanities, but for education. You, Truin, are in direct line for the throne. You will need to learn a great deal about marine warfare, diplomacy, and the quality of life around the Elder Isles. The same applies to Eilis, who must justify his rank and its perquisites by service to Trossanet. Sir, I shall do my best, said Eilis. And I no less, declared Truin. Grannis nodded. Very good, I expected no less. During this voyage, remember well, you are under the command of Sir Famet. Listen to him carefully and profit by his wisdom. He will not require your advice, so please reserve your opinions and theories unless they are specifically required. In fact, on this voyage, forget that you are princes and conduct yourselves as cadets, unskilled and inexperienced, but eager to learn. Do I make myself clear, Truin? Truin spoke in a surly voice. I shall obey, of course. Still, I was under the impression... Revise that impression. What of you, Eilis? Eilis could not help but grin. I understand perfectly, sir. I shall do my best to learn. Excellent. Now look around the ship, the two of you, while I confer with Sir Famet. Chapter 9 The pre-dawn air was quiet and cool. The sky showed the colors of citron, pearl, and apricot, which were reflected from the sea. Out from the tumbling river estuary drifted the black ship Smadra, propelled across the water by its sweeps. A mile offshore, the sweeps were shipped. The yards were raised, sails sheeted taut, and backstays set up. With the sunrise came breeze, the ship glided quickly and quietly into the east, and presently Trossanet had become a shadow along the horizon. Eilis, tiring of Truin's company, went forward to the bow, but Truin sauntered after him, 
and took occasion to explain the workings of the bow catapults. Eilis listened with polite detachment. Exasperation and impatience were profitless exercises in dealing with Truin. Essentially, these are no more than monstrous crossbows, said Truin in the voice of one providing insights of great interest to a respectful child. Their range is functionally two hundred yards, though accuracy is compromised on a moving ship. The tensile member is laminated of steel, ash, and hornbeam, assembled and glued in an expert and secret method. The instruments will hurl harpoons, stones, or fireballs, and are highly effective. Eventually, and I shall see to it personally, if need be, we shall deploy a navy of a hundred ships such as this, equipped with ten larger and heavier catapults. There will also be supply ships and an admiral's flagship with proper accommodations. I am not particularly pleased with my present quarters. It is an absurd little place for one of my rank. Here Truin referred to his cubbyhole beside the aft cabin. Eilis occupied a similar space opposite, with Sir Famet enjoying the relatively commodious aft cabin itself. Eilis said in full gravity, Perhaps Sir Famet might consider changing berths with you, if you put it to him in a reasonable manner. Truin merely spat over the rail. He found Eilis's humor at times a trifle tart, and for the rest of the day he had nothing to say. At sundown the winds diminished to a near calm. Sir Famet, Truin, and Eilis took supper at a table on the rear deck, under the tall bronze stern lantern. Over a beaker of red wine, Sir Famet relaxed his taciturnity. Well, then, he asked almost expansively, and how goes the voyage? Truin at once brought forward a set of peevish complaints, while Eilis looked on and listened in slack-jawed wonder. How could Truin be so insensitive? Well enough, or so I suppose, said Truin. There is obvious room for improvement. Indeed, asked Sir Famet without overmuch interest. How so? In the first place, my quarters are intolerably cramped. The ship's designer could well have done better. By adding ten or fifteen feet to the length of the ship, he might have provided two comfortable cabins instead of one, and certainly a pair of dignified privies. True, said Sir Famet, blinking over his wine. With another thirty feet still, we might have brought valets, hairdressers, and concubines. What else troubles you? Truin, absorbed in his grievances, failed to heed the tenor of the remark. I find the crew far too casual. They dress as they please. They lack smartness. They know nothing of punctilio. They take no account of my rank. Today, while I was inspecting the ship, I was told, Move aside, sir, you are in the way, as if I were a squire. No muscle of Sir Famet's hard face so much as twitched. He considered his words, then said, At sea, as on the battlefield, respect does not come automatically. It must be earned. You will be judged by your competence rather than your birth. It is a condition with which I, for one, am content. You will discover that the obsequious sailor, like the over-respectful soldier, is not the one you most want beside you in either a battle or a storm. A trifle daunted, Truin nevertheless argued his point. Still, a proper deference is ultimately important. Otherwise, all authority and order is lost, and we would live like wild animals. This is a picked crew. You will find them orderly indeed when the time comes for order. Sir Famet drew himself up in his chair. Perhaps I should say something about our mission. The overt purpose is to negotiate a set of advantageous treaties. Both I and King Granis would be surprised if we did so. We will be dealing with persons of status exceeding our own, of the most various dispositions, and all stubbornly controlled by their own conceptions. 
King Jewel of Pomperal is an ardent ornithologist. King Milo of Blaylock ordinarily consumes a gill of aquavit before he rises from bed in the morning. The court at Avalon seethes with erotic intrigues, and King Audrey's chief catamite wields more influence than the Lord General Sir Hermes Properogerus. Our policy, therefore, is flexible. At minimum, we hope for polite interest and a perception of our power. Truin frowned and pursed his lips. Why be content with modesty and half-measures? I would hope in my conversations to achieve something closer to the maximum. I suggest that we arrange our strategies more on these terms. Sir Famit, tilting his head back, showed a cool, thin smile to the evening sky and drank wine from his beaker. He set the vessel down with a thump. King Granis and I have established both strategy and tactics, and we will adhere to these procedures. Of course, still two minds are better than one. Truin spoke past Eilis as if he were not present, and there is clearly scope for variation in the arrangements. When circumstances warrant, I shall consult with Prince Eilis and yourself. King Granis envisioned such training for you both. You may be present at certain discussions, in which case you shall listen, but at no time speak unless I direct you to do so. Is this clear, Prince Eilis? Sir, absolutely. Prince Truin. Truin performed a curt bow, whose effect he at once attempted to ameliorate with a suave gesture. Naturally, sir, we are under your orders. I will not put forward my personal views. Still, I hope that you would keep me informed as to all negotiations and commitments, since, after all, it is I who eventually must deal with the aftermath. Sir Famet responded with a cool smile. In this regard, Prince Truin, I will do my best to oblige you. In that case, declared Truin in a hearty voice, there is no more to be said. Halfway through the morning, an islet appeared off the port bow. A quarter mile away, the sheets were eased and the ship lost way. Eilis went to the boatswain, who stood by the rail. Why are we stopping? Yonder is Malia, the Merman's Isle. Look sharp. Sometimes you will see them on the low rocks or even on the beach. A raft of scrap lumber was lifted on the cargo boom, jars of honey, packets of raisins and dried apricots were stowed aboard. The raft was lowered into the sea and set adrift. Looking down through the clear water, Eilis saw the flicker of pallid shapes, an upturned face with hair floating behind. It was a strange, narrow face with limpid black eyes, a long, thin nose, an expression wild or avid or excited or gleeful. There were no precepts in Eilis's background for the comprehension of such an expression. For a few minutes, the smadra floated still in the water. The raft drifted slowly at first, then more purposefully and with small jerks and impulses moved toward the island. Eilis put another question to the bosun. What if we went to the island with such gifts? Sir, who can say? If you dared to row your boat yonder without such gifts, you would surely find misfortune. It is wise to deal politely with the merfolk. After all, the sea is theirs. Now then, time to be underway. Oi, you yonder, trim the sheets, over with the elm. Let's kick up the spume. The days passed. Landfalls were made and departures taken. Later, Eilis recalled the events of the voyage as a collage of sounds, voices, music, faces and forms, helmets, armor, hats and garments, reeks, perfumes and airs, personalities and postures, ports, piers, anchorages and roadsteads. There were receptions, audiences, banquets, and balls. 
Eilis could not gauge the effect of their visits. They made, so he felt, a good impression. The integrity and strength of Sir Famit could not be mistaken, and Truin, for the most part, held his tongue. The kings were uniformly evasive and would consider no commitments. Drunken King Milo of Blaylock was sober enough to point out, Yonder stand the tall forts of Leoness, where the Troyce navy exerts no strength. Sir, it is our hope that as allies we may ease the threat of these forts. King Milo responded only with a melancholy gesture and raised a tankard of aquavit to his mouth. Mad King Duel of Pomperel was equally indefinite. To obtain an audience, the Troyes delegation traveled to the summer palace Alcantade, through a pleasant and prosperous land. The folk of Pomperel, far from resenting the obsessions of their monarch, enjoyed his antics. He was not only tolerated in his follies, but encouraged. King Duel's madness was harmless enough. He felt an excessive partiality for birds, and indulged himself with absurd fancies, some of which, by virtue of his power, he was able to make real. He dubbed his ministers with such titles as Lord Goldfinch, Lord Snipe, Lord Peewit, Lord Bobolink, Lord Tanager. His dukes were Duke Blue Jay, Duke Curlew, Duke Black Crested Tern, Duke Nightingale. His edicts proscribed the eating of eggs as a cruel and murderous delinquency subject to punishment dire and stern. Alcantade, the summer palace, had appeared to King Jewel in a dream. Upon awakening, he called his architects and ordained the substance of his vision. As might be conjectured, Alcantade was an unusual structure, but nonetheless a place of curious charm. Light, fragile, painted in gay colors, with tall roofs at various levels. Arriving at Alcantade, Sir Famit, Eilis, and Truin discovered King Jewel resting aboard his swan-headed barge, which a dozen young girls, clad in white feathers, propelled slowly across the lake. In due course, King Duel stepped ashore. A small, sallow man of middle years, he greeted the envoys with cordiality. Welcome, welcome, a pleasure to meet citizens of Trossenet, a land of which I have heard many great things. The broad-billed grebe nests along the rocky shores in profusion, and the nuthatch dines to satiety upon the acorns of your splendid oaks. The great choice horned owls are renowned everywhere for their majesty. I confess to a partiality for birds. They delight me with their grace and courage. But enough of my enthusiasms. What brings you to Alcantade? Your majesty, we are the envoys of King Granis, and we bear his earnest message. When you are so disposed, I will speak it out before you. What better time than now? Steward, bring us refreshment. We will sit at yonder table. Speak now your message. Sir Famit looked right and left at the courtiers who stood in polite proximity. Sir, might you not prefer to hear me in private? Not at all, declared King Jewel. At Alcantade we have no secrets. We are like birds in an orchard of ripe fruit, where everyone trills his happiest song. Speak on, Sir Famit. Very well, sir. I will cite certain events which disquiet King Granis of Trossenet. Sir Famit spoke. King Duel listened carefully, with head cocked to the side. Sir Famit finished his exposition. These, sir, are the dangers which menace us all in the not-too-distant future. King Duel grimaced. Dangers, everywhere dangers. I am beset on all hands, so that often I hardly take rest of nights. King Duel's voice became nasal, and he twitched in his chair as he spoke. Daily I hear a dozen pitiful cries for protection. We guard our entire north border against the cats, stoats, and weasels employed by King Audrey. The Godelians are also a menace, even though their roosts lie a hundred leagues distant. 
They breed and train the cannibal falcons, each a traitor to his kind. To the West is an even more baleful threat, and I allude to Duke Fod Carfilio, who breathes green air. Like the Godelians, he hunts with falcons, using bird against bird. Sir Famet protested in a strained voice, Still, you need fear no actual assault. Tinsin Firo stands far beyond the forest. King Duel shrugged. It is admittedly a long day's flight, but we must face reality. I have named Carfilio a dastard, and he dared not retort for fear of my mighty talons. Now he skulks in his toad wallow, planning the worst kinds of mischief. Prince Truin, ignoring Sir Famet's cold blue side glance, spoke out briskly, why not place the strength of those same talons beside those of your fellow birds? Our flock shares your views in regard to Carfilio and his ally, King Casimir. Together we can rebuff their attacks with great blows of talon and beak. True, some day we shall see the formation of just such a mighty force. In the meantime, each must contribute where he can— I have cowed the squamous Carfilio and defied the Godelians, nor do I spare mercy upon Audrey's bird-killers. You are thereby liberated to aid us against the scar and sweep them from the sea. Each does his part. I through the air, you on the ocean wave. The Smadra arrived at Avalon, largest and oldest city of the Elder Isles, a place of great palaces, a university, theaters, and an enormous public bath. There were a dozen temples erected to the glory of Mithra, Dis, Jupiter, Jehovah, Lug, Gaia, Enlil, Dagon, Baal, Cronus, and three-headed Dion of the ancient Hybrasian pantheon. The Somrak Eum Dor, a massive domed structure, housed the sacred throne Evandig and the table Kerbra on Maiden, objects whose custody in olden days had legitimized the kings of Hybris. The table was divided into twenty-three segments, each carved with now unreadable glyphs, purportedly the names of twenty-two in the service of the fabulous King Mahadian. In years to come, a table in the style of Kerbra on Maiden would be celebrated as the round table of King Arthur. King Audrey returned from his summer palace, riding in a scarlet and gold carriage drawn by six white unicorns. On the same afternoon, the Troyce emissaries were allowed an audience. King Audrey, a tall, saturnine man, had a face of fascinating ugliness— he was noted for his amours and said to be perceptive, self-indulgent, vain, and occasionally cruel. He greeted the Troyce with urbanity and put them at their ease. Sir Famet delivered his message while King Audrey leaned back into his cushions, eyes half-closed, stroking the white cat which had jumped into his lap. Sir Famet concluded his statement. Sir, that is my message to you from King Granis. King Audrey nodded slowly. It is a proposal with many sides and more edges. Yes, of course, I dearly yearn for the subjugation of Casimir and the end of his ambitions. But before I can commit treasure, arms, and blood to such a project, I must secure my flanks. Were I to look away an instant, the Godelians would come pounding down on me, looting, burning, taking slaves. North Ulfland is a wilderness, and the Scar have encroached upon the foreshore. If I embroiled myself in North Ulfland against the Scar, then Casimir would be upon me. King Audrey reflected a moment, then... Candor is such a poor policy that we all recoil automatically from the truth. In this case, you might as well know the truth. It is to my best interests that Trossinet and Leoness maintain a stalemate. Daily the scar grows stronger in North Ulfland. They too have ambitions. I hold them in check with my Fort Politets. 
First the Gudelians, then the Scar, then Casimir. Meanwhile, what if Casimir, with the help of the Scar, takes Trossanet? A disaster for both of us. Fight well. Dartweg, king of the Gedelian Celts, listened to Sir Famit with a ponderous and bland courtesy. Sir Famit came to the end of his remarks. That is the situation, as it seems from Trocinet. If events go with King Casimir, he will move at last into Gedelia, and you will be destroyed. King Dartwig pulled at his red beard. A druid bent to mutter in his ear, and Dartwig nodded. He rose to his feet. We cannot spare the doubts, so that they may conquer Leoness. They would thereupon attack us with new strength. No, we must guard our interests. The Smadra sailed on, through days bright with sunlight and nights sparkling with stars, across Daffdilly Bay, around Tawsey Head, and into the narrow sea, with the wind dead fair and wake warbling up astern then south, past Skagain and Frihain, and smaller islands by the dozens, cliff-girt places of forest, moor, and crag, exposed to all the winds of the Atlantic, inhabited by multitudes of seabirds and the ska. On various occasions, ska ships were sighted, and as many of the small trading cogs, Irish, Cornish, Trois, or Aquitanian, which the ska suffered to ply the narrow sea. The ska ships made no effort to close, perhaps because the smadra clearly was able to outrun them down a fresh wind. Oaldus, where ailing King Oriante maintained a semblance of a court, was passed by. The final port of call would be Is, at the mouth of the Evander, where the forty factors preserved the independence of Is against Carfilio, Six hours out of Is, the wind slackened, and at this time a ska longship, powered by sweeps and a red and black square sail, came in view. Upon sighting the Smadra, it changed course. The Smadra, unable to outrun the ska ship, prepared for battle. The catapults were manned and armed, firepots prepared and slung to booms, arrow screens raised above the bulwarks. The battle went quickly. After a few arrow volleys, the ska moved in close and tried to grapple. The Trois returned the arrow fire, then winged out a boom and slung a firepot accurately onto the longship, where it exploded in a terrible surprise of yellow flame. At a range of thirty yards, the Smadra's catapults, in a leisurely fashion, broke the longship apart. The Smadra stood by to rescue survivors, but the Ska made no attempt to swim from the wallowing hulk of their once proud ship, which presently sank under the weight of its loot. The Ska commander, a tall black-haired man in a three-pronged steel helmet and a white cap over the pangolin scales of his armor, stood immobile on the afterdeck and so sank with his ship. Casualties aboard the Smadra were slight. Unfortunately, they included Sir Famit, who in the initial volley took an arrow in the eye and now lay dead on the afterdeck, with the arrow shaft protruding from his head two feet into the air. Prince Truin, conceiving himself the second-ranking member of the delegation, took command of the ship. "'Into the sea with our honored dead,' he told the captain, the rites of mourning must wait upon our return to Domris. We will proceed as before to Is. The Smadra approached Is from the sea. At first nothing could be seen but a line of low hills parallel to the shore. Then, like shadows looming through the haze, the high serrated outline of the teach tak teach, literally peak on peak in one of the precursor tongues, appeared. A wide, pale beach gleamed in the sunlight with a glistening fringe of surf. Presently the mouth of the river Evander appeared beside an isolated white palace on the beach. Eilis's attention was caught by its air of seclusion and secrecy, and its unusual architecture, which was like none other of his experience. 
The Smadra entered the Evander estuary, and gaps in the dark foliage shrouding the hills revealed many more white palaces on terrace above terrace. Clearly, Is was a rich and ancient city. A stone jetty came into view, with ships moored alongside, and behind, a row of shops, taverns, greengrocers' booths, and fishmongers' stalls. The Smadra eased close to the jetty, made fast to wooden bollards carved to represent the torsos of mermen. Truan, Eilis, and a pair of ship's officers jumped ashore. No one took notice of their presence. Truan had long since placed himself thoroughly in command of the voyage. By various hints and signals, he gave Eilis to understand that in the context of the present business, Eilis and the ship's officers occupied an exactly equal standing as members of the retinue. Eilis, sourly amused, accepted the situation without comment. The voyage was almost over, and Truin, in all probability, for better or worse, would be a future king of Trocinet. At Truin's behest, Eilis made inquiries, and the group was directed to the palace of Lord Shane, the first factor of Is. The route took them a quarter mile at a slant up the hillside, from terrace to terrace, in the shade of tall samphire trees. Lord Shane received the four Trois with neither surprise nor effusive demonstration. Truin performed the introductions. Sir, I am Truin, prince at the court of Miraldra and nephew to King Granis of Trocinet. Here is Sir Leaves and Sir Elmeret, and here my cousin, Prince Eilis of Watershade. Lord Shane acknowledged the introductions informally. Please be seated. He indicated settees and signaled his servants to bring refreshment. He himself remained standing, a slender, olive-skinned man of early maturity, dark-haired, who carried himself with the elegance of a mythical dawn dancer. His intelligence was obvious, his manners were courteous, but so in contrast to Truin's sententiousness that he seemed almost frivolous. Truin explained the business of the delegation as he had heard Sir Famit put it on previous occasions. To Eilis's mind, an insensitive misreading of conditions at the city is, what with Fode Carfilio looming above Vale Evander only twenty miles east, and ska ships daily visible from the jetty. Shane, half smiling, shook his head and gave Truin's proposals short shrift. Understand, if you will, that Is is something of a special case. Normally we are subject to the Duke of Vale Evander, who in equal measure is a dutiful vassal of King Orienti, which is to say, we heed Carfilio's orders even less than he obeys King Orienti. Not at all, in sheer fact. We are detached from the politics of the Elder Isles. King Casimir, King Audrey, King Granis, they are all beyond our concerns. Truin made an incredulous expostulation. You would seem to be vulnerable on both sides, to Scar and Carfilio alike. Shane, smiling, demolished Truin's concept. We are Trevenous, like all the folk of the Vale. Carfilio has only a hundred men of his own. He could raise a thousand or even two thousand troops from the valley if a clear need arose, but never to attack Is. Still, what of the scar? On a moment's notice they could overrun the city. Shane once again demurred. We Trevenus are an old race, as old as the scar. They will never attack us. I cannot understand this, muttered Truin. Are you magicians? Let us talk of other matters. You are returning to Trocinet? At once. Shane looked quizzically around the group. With absolutely no offense intended, I am perplexed that King Granis sends what appears a rather junior group on affairs of so much consequence, especially in view of his special interests here in South Ulfland. What special interests are these? Are they not clear? If Prince Quilsey dies without issue, 
Glanis is next in the lawful succession, through the line that starts with Danglish, Duke of South Ulfland, who was grandfather to Granis's father and also grandfather to Orianti. But surely you were well aware of all this. Yes, of course, said Truin. Naturally, we keep abreast of such matters. Shane was now openly smiling. And naturally, you are aware of the new circumstances in Trossenet? Naturally, said Truin. We are returning to Domris at once. He rose to his feet and bowed stiffly. I regret that you could not take a more positive attitude. Still, it will have to serve. I bid you a pleasant voyage home. The Trois emissaries returned down through Is to the jetty. Truin muttered, What could he mean, new circumstances in Trossenet? Why didn't you ask him? asked Eilis in a studiously neutral voice. Because I chose not to do so, snapped Truin. Upon reaching the jetty, they noticed a Trois cog, newly arrived and only just making its lines fast to the bollards. Truin stopped short. I'll just have a word with the captain. You three prepare the smadra for immediate sailing. The three returned aboard the smadra. Ten minutes later, Truin left the cog and came along the jetty, walking with a slow and thoughtful step. Before boarding, he turned and looked up Vale of Vander. Then slowly he turned and boarded the smadra. Eilis asked, What were the new circumstances? The captain could tell me nothing. You seem suddenly very glum. Truin compressed his lips but had no comment to make. He scanned the horizon. The cog lookout sighted a pirate ship. We must be on the alert. Truin turned away. I am not altogether well. I must rest. He lurched away to the aft cabin which he had occupied since the death of Sir Famit. The smadra departed the harbor. As they passed the white palace on the beach, Eilis, from the afterdeck, noticed a young woman who had come out upon the terrace. Distance blurred her features, but Eilis was able to make out her long black hair, and by her carriage or some other attribute, he knew her to be well-favored, perhaps even beautiful. He raised his arm and waved to her, but she made no response and returned into the palace. The Smadra put out to sea. The lookouts scanned the horizon but reported no other shipping. The pirate vessel, if such indeed existed, was nowhere to be seen. Truin failed to reappear on deck until noon of the following day. His indisposition, whatever its source, had departed, and Truin seemed once more in sound health, if still somewhat gaunt and pale. Except for a few words with the captain as to the progress of the ship, he spoke to no one and presently returned to his cabin, where the steward brought him a pot of boiled beef with leeks. An hour before sunset, Truin once more stepped out on deck. He looked at the low sun and asked the captain, Why do we sail this course? Sir, we have made a bit too much easting. Should the wind rise or shift, we might well fall in peril of Tark, which I put yonder, just over the horizon. Then we are having a slow passage. Something slow, sir, but easy. I see no occasion to man the sweeps. Quite so. Eilis took supper with Truin, who suddenly became talkative and formulated a dozen grandiose plans. When I am king, I shall make myself known as Monarch of the Seas— I will build thirty warships, each with a complement of a hundred mariners. He went on to describe the projected ships in detail. We will care never a fig whether Kazmir allies himself with the Skaw or the Tartars or the Mamelukes of Araby. That is a noble prospect. Truin disclosed even more elaborate schemes. Casimir intends to be king of the Elder Isles. He claims lineage from the first Olam. King Audrey also pretends to the same throne. He has a Vandig to validate his claim. 
I also can claim lineage from Olam, and if I were to make a great raid and take Evandig for my own, why should I not aspire to the same realm? It is an ambitious concept, said Eilis, and many heads would be lopped before Truin achieved his purpose, so thought Eilis. Truin glanced sideways at Eilis from under his heavy brows. He drank a goblet of wine at a gulp and once more became taciturn. Presently Eilis went out on the afterdeck where he leaned on the taffrail and watched the afterglow and its shifting reflections on the water. In another two days the voyage would be over and he would be done with Truin and his irritating habits. A joyful thought— Eilis turned away from the taffrail and went forward to where the off-watch crew sat under a flaring lamp, a few gambling to dice, one singing mournful ballads to the chords of his lute. Eilis remained half an hour, then went aft to his cubbyhole. Dawn found the Smadra well into the straits of Palisidra. At noon, Cape Palisidra, the western tip of Trossinet, loomed into view, then disappeared, and the Smadra now rode the waters of the Lear. During the afternoon the wind died, and the Smadra floated motionless, with spars rattling and sails flapping. Toward sunset the wind returned, but from a different quarter. The captain put the ship on a starboard tack to sail almost due north. Truin gave vent to his dissatisfaction. We'll never make Domris tomorrow at this course. The captain, who had adjusted to Truin only with difficulty, gave an indifferent shrug. Sir, the port tack takes us into the twirls, the ship's graveyard. The winds will drive us to Domris tomorrow, if the currents do not throw us off. Well then, what of these currents? They are unpredictable. The tide flows in and out of the Lear. The currents may swing us in any of four directions. They flow at speed. They eddy in the middle of the Lear. They have thrown many sound ships on the rocks. In that case, be vigilant. Double the lookout. Sir, all that needs doing already has been done. At sunset, the wind died again, and the Smadra lay motionless. The sun set into smoky orange haze, while Eilis dined with Truin in the aft cabin. Truin seemed preoccupied and spoke hardly a word during the entire meal so that Eilis was glad to depart the cabin. The afterglow was lost in a bank of clouds. The night was dark. Overhead the stars shone with brilliance. A chilly breeze suddenly sprang up from the southeast. Close hauled the smadra beat to the east. Eilis went forward to where the off-watch entertained itself. Eilis joined the dice game. He lost a few coppers, then won them back, then finally lost all the coins in his pocket. At midnight the watch changed. Eilis returned aft. Rather than immerse himself immediately in his cubbyhole, he climbed up the ladder to the afterdeck. Breeze still filled the sails, wake sparkling and streaked with phosphorescence, bubbled up astern. Leaning on the taffrail, Eilis watched the flickering lights. A step behind him, a presence. Arms gripped his legs, he was lifted and flung into space. He knew a brief sensation of tilting sky and whirling stars, then struck into water. Down, down into the tumble of wake, and his chief emotion was still astonishment. He rose to the surface. All directions were the same. Where was the smadra? He opened his mouth to yell and took a throat full of water. Gasping and coughing, Eilis called out once more, but produced only a dismal croak. The next attempt was stronger, but thin and weak, hardly more than the cry of a seabird. The ship was gone. Eilis floated alone at the center of his private cosmos. Who had cast him into the sea? Truin? Why would Truin do such a deed? No reason whatever. Then who? The speculations faded from his mind. They were irrelevant, part of another existence. His new identity was one with the stars and the waves. His legs felt heavy. He twisted in the water, removed his boots, and let them sink. 
He slipped out of his doublet, which was also heavy. Now he remained afloat with less effort. The wind blew from the south, Eilis swam with the wind at his back, which was more comfortable than with the waves breaking into his face. The waves lifted him and carried him forward on their surge. He felt at ease. His mood was almost exalted, even though the water, at first cold, then tolerable, once more seemed chilly. With disarming stealth, he began to feel comfortable again. Eilis felt at peace. It would be easy now to relax, to slide away into languor. If he slept, he would never awaken. Worse, he would never discover who had thrown him into the sea. I am Eilis of Watershade. He exerted himself. He moved his arms and legs to swim, and once again became uncomfortably cold. How long had he floated in this dark water? He looked up to the sky. The stars had shifted. Arcturus was gone, and Vega hung low in the west. For a period, the first level of consciousness departed, and he knew only a bleary awareness which started to flicker and go out. Something disturbed him. A quiver of sentience returned. The eastern sky glowed yellow. Dawn was at hand. The water around him was black as iron, off to the side, a hundred yards away, water foamed around the base of a rock. He looked at it with sad interest, but wind and waves and current carried him past. A roaring soon filled his ears. He felt a sudden harsh impact, then he was sucked away by a wave, picked up and thrown against something cruelly sharp. With numb arms and sodden fingers, he tried to cling, but another surge pulled him away. Chapter 10 During the reigns of Olam I, great king of the Elder Isles, and his immediate successors, the throne Evandig and the sacred stone table Kerbra on Maiden occupied place at Hadian. Olam III, the Vain, moved throne and table to Avalon. This act and its consequences came about as an oblique result of discord among the arch-magicians of the land. At this time they numbered eight, Mergen, Sartzenek, Desmi, Myolander, Bibelidus, Widfoot, Codfoot, and Numik. Whenever the magicians met together, another appeared, a tall shape muffled in a long black cape, with a wide-brimmed black hat obscuring his features. He stood always back in the shadows and never spoke. When one or another of the magicians chanced to look into his face, they saw black emptiness with a pair of far stars where his eyes might be. The presence of the ninth magician, if such he were, at first made for uneasiness, but in due course, since the presence seemed to affect nothing, he was ignored, save for occasional side glances. Mergen was reckoned first among his fellows, by no means to the satisfaction of all. Sartzenek, in particular, resented Mergen's austere inflexibility, while Desmi deplored his strictures against meddling with affairs of the countryside, which was her sport. Mergen made his residence at Swer Smod, a rambling stone manse in the northwest part of Leoness, where the Teach Tak Teach sloped down into the forest of Tontraval. He based his edict on the thesis that any assistance rendered to a favorite must sooner or later transgress upon the interests of other magicians. Sartzenek, perhaps the most capricious and unpredictable of all the magicians, resided at Feroli, deep inside the forest, in the then Grand Duchy of de Hout. He long had resented Mergen's prohibitions and contravened them as fragrantly as he dared. Sartzenek occasionally conducted erotic experiments with the witch Desmi. Stung by the derision of Widfoot, Sartzenek retaliated with the spell of total enlightenment, so that Widfoot suddenly knew everything which might be known, the history of each atom of the universe, the devolvements of eight kinds of time, the possible phases of each succeeding instant. 
all the flavors, sounds, sights, smells of the world, as well as percepts relative to nine other more unusual senses. Widfoot became palsied and paralyzed and could not so much as feed himself. He stood trembling in confusion until he desiccated to a wisp and blew away on the wind. Codfoot made an indignant protest, exciting Sartsenek to such a rage that he put by all caution and destroyed Codfoot with a plague of maggots. Codfoot's entire surface seethed under an inch-thick layer of worms, to such effect that Codfoot lost control of his wisdom and tore himself to pieces. The surviving magicians, with the exception of Desmi, invoked pressures which Sartsenek could not repugn. He was compressed into an iron post seven feet tall and four inches square, so that only upon careful scrutiny might his distorted features be noted. This post was similar to the post at Twitten Cross. The Sartsenek post was implanted at the very peak of Mount Agon. Whenever lightning struck down, Sartsenek's etched features were said to twitch and quiver. A certain Tamurello immediately took up residence in Sartsenek's manse, Feroli, and all understood him to be Sartsenek's alter ego, or scion, in certain respects an extension of Sartsenek himself. In just such a fashion, Shimrod was known to be an extension or alter ego of Mergen, though their personalities had separated and they were different individuals. Like Sartsenek, Tamurello was tall, heavy of physique, with black eyes, black curls, a full mouth, round chin, and a temperament which expressed itself in terms of vivid emotion. The witch Desmi, who had performed erotic conjunctions with Sartsenek, now amused herself with King Olam III, she appeared to him as a female clothed with a soft pelt of black fur and an oddly beautiful cat-like mask. This creature knew a thousand lascivious tricks. King Olam, befuddled and foolish, succumbed to her will. To spite Mergen, Desmi persuaded Olam to move his throne Evandig and the table Kerbra on Maiden to Avalon. The odd tranquility was gone. The magicians were at odds, each suspicious of the other. Mergen, in cold disgust, isolated himself at Swer Smod. Difficult times came upon the Elder Isles. King Olam, now deranged, attempted copulation with a leopard. He was savaged and died. His son Uther I, a frail and timid stripling, no longer enjoyed the support of Mergen. Goths invaded the north coast of De Hout and looted Wanish Isle, where they sacked the monastery and burned the great library. Audrey, Grand Duke of De Hout, raised an army and destroyed the Goths at the Battle of Hax, but suffered such losses that the Celtic Godelians moved east and took the Wisrod Peninsula. King Uther, after months of indecision, marched his army against the Godelians only to meet disaster at the Battle of Wan Willow Ford, where he was killed. His son, Uther II, fled north to England, where in due course he sired Uther Pendragon, father to King Arthur of Cornwall. The dukes of the Elder Isles met at Avalon to choose a new king— Duke Friston of Lyonnais claimed kingship by virtue of lineage, while the aging Duke Audrey of de Hout cited the throne of Evandig and the table Kerbra on Maiden in support of his own claim. The conclave dissolved in acrimony. Each duke returned home and thereafter styled himself king of his own personal domain. Instead of one, there were now ten kingdoms— North Ulfland, South Ulfland, De Hout, Cadas, Blaylock, Pomperel, Godelia, Trocinet, Dassinet, and Lyonnais. The new kingdoms found ample scope for contention. King Friston of Lyonnais and his ally King Joel of Cadas went to war against De Hout and Pomperel. At the Battle of Orm Hill, Friston killed the old but stalwart Audrey I and was himself killed by an arrow, 
The battle and the war ended indecisively, with each side charged with hatred for the other. Prince Casimir, known as the Popinjay, fought in the battle bravely, but without recklessness, and returned to Lyoness town as king. Immediately he abandoned his elegant postures for a hard practicality, and set himself to the task of strengthening his realm. A year after Casimir became king, he married Princess Solace of Aquitania, a handsome blonde maiden with Gothic blood in her veins, whose stately mien disguised a stolid temperament. Casimir considered himself a patron of the magical arts. In a secret chamber he kept a number of curio and magical adjuncts, including a book of incantations indicted in illegible script but which glowed dimly in the dark. When Casimir ran his finger over the runes, a sensation peculiar to each incantation suffused his mind. He could tolerate one such contact, twice caused him to sweat, thrice he dared not lest he lose control of himself. A griffin's claw reposed in an onyx case, a gallstone cast by the ogre Hulamides gave off a peculiar stench. A small yellow skack, the least in the hierarchy of fairies, sat in a bottle, resignedly awaiting his eventual release. On a wall hung an article of real power, Priscillian, the so-called magic mirror. This mirror would answer three questions to its owner, who then must relinquish it to another. Should the owner ask a fourth question, the mirror would make glad response, then dissolve into freedom. King Casimir had put three questions and now reserved the fourth against emergency. According to popular wisdom, the company of magicians was usually more bane than benefit. Though he well knew of Mergen's edicts, Casimir at various times solicited aid from arch-magicians by Belidus and Numic, and several other lesser magicians, to be everywhere rebuffed. Casimir received news of the sorceress Desmi, reputedly the enemy of Mergen. By reliable report, she had taken herself to the Goblin Fair, an annual occasion which she enjoyed and never failed to patronize. Casimir disguised himself under blue and iron-gray armor and a shield displaying two dragons rampant. He named himself Sir Perdrax, knight-errant, and with a small retinue, rode into the forest of Tontreval. In due course he arrived at Twitten Cross. The inn known as the Laughing Sun and the Crying Moon was filled to capacity. Casimir was forced to accept a place in the barn— a quarter mile into the forest, he found the goblin fair. Desmi was nowhere to be seen. Casimir wandered among the booths. He saw much to interest him and paid good gold for various oddments. Late in the afternoon, he noted a tall woman, somewhat gaunt of face and feature, her blue hair gathered into a silver cage. She wore a white tabard embroidered in black and red, she evoked in King Casimir and all men who saw her a curious disturbance. Fascination mingled with revulsion. This was Desmi the sorceress. Casimir approached her with caution, where she stood haggling with an old knave who kept a booth. The merchant's hair was yellow, his skin sallow, his nose was split and his eyes were like copper pellets. Goblin blood flowed in his veins. He held up a feather for her inspection. This feather, he said, is indispensable to the conduct of daily affairs, in that it infallibly detects fraudulence. Astounding, declared Desmi in a voice of boredom. Would you say that here is an ordinary feather taken from the carcass of a dead blue jay? Yes, dead or even alive, so I would assume. You would be as wrong as an umpdoodle's trivet. Indeed, how is this miraculous feather used? Nothing could be simpler. If you suspect a cheat, a liar, or a swindler, touch him with the feather. 
If the feather turns yellow, your suspicions are confirmed. If the feather remains blue, then the person with whom you are dealing is staunch and true. This excellent feather is yours for six crowns of gold. Desmi uttered a metallic laugh. Do you think me so gullible? It is almost insulting. Evidently you expect me to test you with the feather. Then, when it remains blue, I pay over to you my gold. Precisely! The feather would verify my assertions. Desmi took the feather and touched it to the split nose. Instantly the feather became bright yellow. Desmi repeated her scornful laugh. No less than I suspected. The feather declares you to be a cheat. Ha-ha! Does not the feather perform exactly as I have claimed? How can I be a cheat? Desmi frowningly regarded the feather, then threw it back upon the counter. I have no time for conundrums. Haughtily, she strolled away to inspect the sale of a young harpy in a cage. After a moment, Casimir approached. You are the sorceress, Desmi. Desmi fixed her attention on him. And who are you? I call myself Sir Perdrax, knight errant from Aquitaine. Desmi smiled and nodded. And what do you wish of me? It is a delicate matter. May I count upon your discretion? To a certain extent. I will express myself bluntly. I serve King Casimir of Lyoness, who intends to restore the throne of Andig to its rightful place. To this end, he implores your advice. The archmagician Mergen forbids such involvement. Already you are at odds with Mergen. How long will you obey his precepts? Not forever. How would Casimir reward me? State your terms. I will communicate them. Desmi became suddenly fretful. Tell Casimir to come in his own right to my palace at Is. There I will talk to him. Sir Perdrax bowed and Desmi moved away. Presently she departed through the forest in a palanquin carried by six running shadows. Before setting out for Is, King Casimir brooded long and well. Desmi was known for her bitter bargains. At last he ordered out the royal Gallius, and on a sparkling windy day sailed out past the breakwater around Cape Farewell, and so to Is. Casimir disembarked upon the stone jetty and walked down the beach to Desmi's white palace. Casimir found Desmi on a seaward-facing terrace, leaning on the balustrade, half in the shade of a tall marble urn, from which trailed the foliage of sweet arbutus. A change had come over Desmi. Casimir halted, wondering at her pallor, hollow cheeks, and gaunt neck, her fingers thin and knobbed at the knuckles hooked over the lip of the balustrade. Her feet, in silver sandals, were long and frail and showed a net of purple veins. Casimir stood slack-jawed and graceless, feeling himself in the presence of mysteries far beyond his understanding. Desmi glanced at him sidelong, showing neither surprise nor pleasure. So you have come. Casimir made a rather strained effort to regain the initiative which he felt should rightly be his. Did you not expect me? Desmi said only, You are here too late. How so? exclaimed Casimir in new concern. All things change. I have no more interest in the affairs of men. Your forays and wars are a trouble. They disturb the quiet of the countryside. There is no need for war. I want only a Vandig. Give me magic or a mantle of stealth so that I may take a Vandig without war. Desmi laughed a soft, wild laugh. I am known for my bitter bargains. 
Would you pay my price? What is your price? Desmi looked out toward the sea's horizon. At last she spoke, so quietly that Casimir came a step closer to hear. Listen, I will tell you this. Marry Soldren well. Her son will sit on Evandic. And what is my price for this presagement? Nothing whatever, for the knowledge will do you no service. Desmi abruptly turned and walked through one in a line of tall archways into the shadows of her palace. Casimir watched the thin form become indistinct and disappear. He waited a moment, standing in the hot sunlight. No sound could be heard but the sigh of surf. Casimir swung away and returned to his ship. Desmi watched the galleus dwindle across the blue sea. She was alone in her palace. For three months she had awaited Tamurello's visit. He had not come, and the message of his absence was clear. She went into her workroom, unclasped her gown, and let it slip to the floor. She studied herself in the mirror to see grim features, a body bony, lank, almost epicene. Coarse black hair matted her head. Her arms and legs were lean and graceless. Such was her natural embodiment, a self in which she felt most easy. Other guises required concentration, lest they become loose and dissolve. Desmi went to her cabinets and brought out a variety of instruments. Over a time of two hours, she worked a great spell to sunder herself into a plasm which entered a vessel of three vents. The plasm churned, distilled, and emerged by the vents to coalesce into three forms. The first was a maiden of exquisite conformation, with violet-blue eyes and black hair soft as midnight. She carried within her the fragrance of violets, and was named Melanchthy. The second form was male. Desmi, still by a trick of time, a husk of sentience, quickly shrouded and covered it, lest others, such as Tamurello, discover its existence. The third form, a demented, squeaking creature, served as sump for Desmi's most repugnant aspects. Shaking with disgust, Desmi quelled the horrid thing and burnt it in a furnace, where it writhed and screamed. A green fume rose from the furnace. Melanchthy shrank back, but involuntarily gasped upon a wisp of the stench. The second form, shrouded behind a cloak, inhaled the stench with savor. Vitality had drained from Desmi. She faded to smoke and was gone. Of the three components she had yielded, only Melanchthy, fresh with the subtle odor of violets, remained at the palace. The second, still shrouded, was taken to the castle Tinsin Fyral, at the head of Vale Evander. The third had become a handful of black ashes and a lingering stench in the workroom. Chapter 11 in the chapel at the top of the garden, Soldren's bed had been arranged, and here a tall, dour kitchen maid named Bagnold daily brought food, precisely at noon. Bagnold was half deaf and might have been mute as well for all her conversation. She was required to verify Soldren's presence, and if Soldren were not at the chapel, Bagnold trudged angrily down into the garden to find her, which was almost every day since Soldren gave no heed to time. After a period, Bagnold tired of the exertion and put the full basket on the chapel steps, picked up the empty basket of the day before, and departed, an arrangement which suited both Soldren and herself. When Bagnold departed, she dropped a heavy oaken beam into iron brackets, thus to bar the door. Soldren might easily have scaled the cliffs to either side of the garden, and some day, so she told herself, she would do so to depart the garden forever. So passed the seasons, spring and summer, and the garden was at its most beautiful, 
though haunted always by stillness and melancholy. Soldren knew the garden at all hours, at gray dawn when dew lay heavy and bird calls came clear and poignant, like sounds at the beginning of time. Late at night, when the full moon rode high above the clouds, she sat under the lime tree looking to see while the surf rattled along the shingle. One evening, Brother Umfred appeared, his round face abeam with innocent goodwill. He carried a basket, which he placed upon the chapel steps. He looked Soldrin carefully up and down. Marvelous! You are as beautiful as ever. Your hair shines, your skin glows. How do you keep so clean? Don't you know? asked Soldrin. I bathe in yonder basin. Brother Umfred raised his hands in mock horror. That is the font for holy water. You have done sacrilege. Soldrin merely shrugged and turned away. With happy gestures, Brother Umfred unpacked his basket. Let us bring cheer to your life. Here is tawny wine. We will drink. No, please leave. Are you not bored and dissatisfied? Not at all. Take your wine and go. Silently, Brother Umfred departed. With the coming of autumn, the leaves turned cold and dusk came early. There was a succession of sad and glorious sunsets. Then came the rains and the cold of winter, whereupon the chapel became bleak and chill. Soldren piled stones to build a hearth and a chimney against one of the windows. The other she wadded tight with twigs and grass. Currents swinging around the cape cast driftwood up on the shingle, which Soldren carried to the chapel to dry and then burnt on the hearth. The rains dwindled, sunlight burned bright through cold, crisp air, and spring was at hand. Daffodils appeared among the flower beds, and the trees put on new leaves. In the sky appeared the stars of spring, Capilla, Arcturus, Denebola. On sunny mornings, cumulus clouds towered high over the sea, and Soldren's blood seemed to quicken. She felt a strange restlessness, which never before had troubled her. The days became longer, and Soldren's perceptions became more acute, and each day began to have its own quality, as if it were one of a limited number. A tension began to form, an imminence, and often Soldren stayed awake all night long so that she might know all to occur in her garden. Brother Umfred paid another visit. He found Soldren sitting on the stone steps of the chapel, sunning herself. Brother Umfred looked at her with curiosity. The sun had tanned her arms, legs, and face, and lightened strands of her hair. She looked the picture of serene good health— in fact, thought Brother Umfred, she seemed almost happy. The fact aroused his carnal suspicions. He wondered if she had taken a lover. Dearest Soldren, my heart bleeds when I think of you solitary and forlorn. Tell me, how do you fare? Well enough, said Soldren. I like solitude. Please do not remain here on my account. Brother Umfred gave a cheerful chuckle. He settled himself beside her. Ah, dearest Soldren. He put his hand on hers. Soldren stared at the fat, white fingers. They felt moist and over-amiable. She moved her hand. The fingers fell away reluctantly. I bring you not only Christian solace, but also a more human consolation— you must recognize that while I am a priest, I am also a man, and susceptible to your beauty. Will you accept this friendship? Umfred's voice became soft and unctuous. Even though the emotion is warmer and dearer than simple friendship? Soldren laughed drearily. She rose to her feet and pointed at the gate. Sir, you have my leave to go. I hope that you will not return. She turned and descended into the garden. Brother Umfred muttered a curse and departed. Soldren sat beside the lime tree and looked out over the sea. I wonder, she asked herself, what will become of me? 
I am beautiful, so everyone says, but it has brought me only bane. Why am I punished as if I had done wrong? Somehow I must bestir myself. I must make a change. After her evening meal, she wandered down to the ruined villa, where she liked best, on clear nights, to watch the stars. Tonight they showed an extraordinary brilliance and seemed to address themselves to her, like wonderful children brimming with secrets. She rose to her feet and stood listening. Imminence hung in the air, its meaning she could not decide. The night breeze became cool. Soldren retreated up through the garden. In the chapel, coals yet smoldered in the fireplace. Soldren blew them ablaze, lay on dry driftwood, and the room became warm. In the morning, wakening very early, she went out into the dawn. Dew lay heavy on foliage and grass. The silence held a primitive quality. Soldren went down through the garden, slow as a sleepwalker, down to the beach. Surf boomed up the shingle. The sun rising colored far clouds at the opposite horizon. At the southern curve of the beach, where currents brought driftwood, she noticed a human body which had floated in on the tide. Soldren halted, then approached step by step and stared down in horror, which quickly became pity. What tragedy! that so cold a death had taken one so young, so wan, so comely. A wave stirred the young man's legs. His fingers spasmodically extended, clawing into the shingle. Soldren dropped to her knees, pulled the body up from the water. She brushed back the sodden curls. The hands were bloody. The head was bruised. Don't die, whispered Soldren. Please, don't die. The eyelids flickered. Eyes, glazed and filmed with seawater, looked up at her, then closed. Soldren dragged the body up into dry sand. When she tugged the right shoulder, he emitted a sad sound. Soldren ran to the chapel, brought back coals and dry wood, and built up a fire. She wiped the cold face with a cloth. Don't die, she said again and again. His skin began to warm. Sunlight shone over the cliffs and down upon the beach. Eyeless opened his eyes once more and wondered if indeed he had died and now roamed the gardens of paradise with the most beautiful of all golden-haired angels to tend him. Soldren asked, How do you feel? My shoulder hurts. Eyeless moved his arm. The twinge of pain assured him that he still lived. Where is this place? This is an old garden near Leoness Town. I am Soldren. She touched his shoulder. Do you think it's broken? I don't know. Can you walk? I can't carry you up the hill. Eilis tried to rise, but fell. He tried again with Soldren's arm around his waist and stood swaying. Come now, I'll try to hold you. Step by step, they climbed up through the garden. At the ruins, they stopped to rest. Eilis said weakly, I must tell you that I am Trois. I fell from a ship. If I am captured, I will be put in prison at the very least. Soldren laughed. You are already in a prison. Mine. I am not allowed to leave. Don't worry. I will keep you safe. She helped him to his feet. At last, they reached the chapel. As best she could, Soldren immobilized Eilis's shoulder with bandages and withes and made him lie upon her couch. Eilis accepted her ministrations and lay watching her. What crimes had this beautiful girl committed that she should be so imprisoned? Soldren fed him first honey and wine, then porridge. Eilis became warm and comfortable and fell asleep. By evening, Eilis's body burned with fever. Soldren knew no remedy save damp cloths on the forehead. By midnight, the fever cooled and Eilis slept. Soldren made herself as comfortable as possible on the floor before the fire. In the morning, Eilis woke, half convinced that his circumstances were unreal, that he was living a dream. 
Gradually, he allowed himself to remember the Smadra. Who had thrown him into the sea? Truin? By reason of sudden madness? Why else? His manner since visiting the Trois Cog at Is had been most peculiar. What had happened aboard the Cog? What possibly could have driven Truin past the brink of sanity? On the third day, Eilis decided that he had broken no bones, and Soldrin eased his bandages. When the sun rose high, the two descended into the garden and sat among the fallen columns of the old Roman villa. Through the golden afternoon, they told each other of their lives. This is not our first meeting, said Eilis. Do you remember visitors from Trocinet about ten years ago? I remember you. Soldrin reflected. There have always been dozens of delegations. I seem to remember someone like you. It was so long ago, I can't be sure. Eilis took her hand, the first time he had touched her in affection. As soon as I am strong, we will escape. It will be a simple affair to climb the stones yonder, then it's over the hill and away. Soldrin spoke in a half-whisper, husky and fearful. If we were captured, she hunched her shoulders together, the king would show us no pity. In a subdued voice, Eilis said, We won't be captured, especially if we plan well and are all cautious. He sat up straight and spoke with great energy. We will be free and away through the countryside. We'll travel by night and hide by day. We'll be one with the vagabonds. And who will know us? Eilis's optimism began to infect Soldrin. The prospect of freedom became exhilarating. Do you really think we'll escape? Of course. How could it be otherwise? Soldrin gazed pensively down the garden and over the sea. I don't know. I have never expected to be happy. I am happy now, even though I am frightened. She laughed nervously. It makes for a strange mood. Don't be frightened, said Eilis. Her nearness overwhelmed him. He put his arm around her waist. Soldrin jumped to her feet. I feel as if a thousand eyes are watching us. Insects, birds, a lizard or two. Eilis scanned the cliffs. I see no one else. Soldrin looked up and down the garden. Nor do I. Still. She seated herself at a demure distance of three feet and turned him an arch side glance. Your health seems to be on the mend. Yes, I feel very well and I cannot bear to look at you without wanting to touch you. He moved close to her, laughing. She slid away. Eilis, no. Wait till your arm is better. I'll be careful of my arm. Someone might come. Who would be so bold? Bagnald, the priest Umfred, my father, the king? Eilis groaned. Destiny could not be so unkind. Soldrin said in a soft voice, Destiny doesn't really care. Night came to the garden. Sitting before the fire, the two supped on bread, onions, and mussels, which Soldrin had gathered from the tidal rocks. Once again they talked of escape. Soldrin said wistfully, Perhaps I will feel strange away from this garden. Every tree, every stone is known to me. But since you came, everything is different. The garden is going from me. Looking into the fire, she gave a little shiver. What is wrong? asked Eilis. I am afraid. Of what? I don't know. We could leave tonight, but for my arm, another few days and I'll be strong again. In the meantime, we must plan. The woman who brings your food, what of her? At noon she brings a basket and takes back the empty basket from the day before. I never speak to her. Could she be bribed? To do what? To bring the food as usual, discard it, and take back the empty basket next day. With a week start we could be far away and never fear capture. Bagnold would never dare, even if she were so disposed, which she isn't. And we have nothing to bribe her with. Have you no jewels, no gold? In my cabinet at the palace I have gold and gems. 
which is to say they are inaccessible. Soldrin considered. Not necessarily. The East Tower is quiet after sunset. I could go directly up to my chamber, and no one would notice. I could be in, out, and away in a trice. Is it truly so simple? Yes. I have gone this way hundreds of times, and seldom have I met anyone along the way. We cannot bribe Bagnold, so we will have free only a day, from noon till noon, plus whatever time your father needs to organize a search. An hour, no more. He moves quickly and with decision. So then, we must have a peasant's disguise, and this is easier said than done. Is there no one whom you trust? One only, the nurse who tended me when I was small. And where is she? Her name is Eherm. She lives on a steading south along the road. She would give us clothes, or anything we asked for without stint, if she knew my need. With disguise, a day's start, and gold for passage to Trossanet, freedom is ours. And once across the Lear, you will be simply Soldren of Watershade. No one will know you for Princess Soldren of Leoness, save only me and perhaps my father, who will love you as I do. Soldren looked up at him. Do you truly love me? Eilis took her hands and pulled her to her feet. Their faces were only inches apart. They kissed each other. I love you most dearly said Eilis. I never want to be parted from you. I love you, Eilis, nor do I wish us to be parted ever. In a transport of joy, the two looked into each other's eyes. Eilis said, Treachery and tribulation brought me here, but I give thanks for all of it. I have been sad, too, said Soldren. Still, if I had not been sent away from the palace, I could not have salvaged your poor drowned corpse. So then, for murderous Truin and cruel Casimir, our thanks. He bent his face to Soldren's. They kissed again and again, then sinking to the couch, lay locked in each other's arms and presently lost themselves in ardor. Weeks passed, swift and strange, a period of bliss, made the more vivid by its background of high adventure. The pain in Eilis's shoulder subsided, and one day in the early afternoon he scaled the cliff to the east of the garden and traversed the rocky slope on the seaward side of the Urquil, slowly and gingerly, since his boots were at the bottom of the sea and he went unshod. Beyond the Urquil he pushed through an undergrowth of scrub oak, elderberry, and rowan, and so gained the road. At this time of day few folk were abroad. Eilis encountered a drover with a flock of sheep and a small boy leading a goat, and neither gave him more than a cursory glance. A mile along the road he turned into a lane, which wound away between hedgerows, and presently arriving at the steading where Eherm lived with her husband and children. Eilis halted in the shadow of the hedge. To his left, at the far side of a meadow, Chastain, the husband, and his two oldest sons cut hay. The cottage lay at the back of a kitchen garden, where leeks, carrots, turnips, and cabbages grew in neat rows. Smoke rose from the chimney. Eilis pondered the situation. If he went to the door and someone other than Eherm showed herself, awkward questions might be asked, for which he had no answers. The difficulty resolved itself. From the door came a stocky, round-faced woman carrying a bucket. She set out toward the pigsty. Eilis called out, Eherm! Dame Eherm! The woman, pausing, examined Eilis with doubt and curiosity, then slowly approached. What do you want? You are Eherm. Yes. Would you do a service in secret for Princess Soldren? Eherm put down the bucket. Please explain, and I'll tell you whether such service lies within my power. And in any event you'll keep the secret. That I will do. Who are you? I am Eilis, a gentleman of Trossinet. I fell from a ship, and Soldren saved me from drowning. 
We are resolved to escape the garden and make our way to Trossinet. We need a disguise of old clothes, hats, and shoes, and Soldrin has no friend but you. We cannot pay you at this time, but if you help us, you will be well rewarded when I return to Trossinet. Ehrm reflected, the creases in her weather-beaten face twitching to the flux of her thoughts. She said, I will help you as best I can. I have long suffered for the cruelty done to poor little Soldrin, who never harmed so much as an insect. Do you need only clothes? Nothing more, and our most grateful thanks for these. The woman who brings Soldrin food, I know her well. She is Bagnalt, an ill-natured creature rancid with gloom. So soon as she notices untouched food, she will scuttle to King Casimir and the search will be on. Eilis gave a fatalistic shrug. We have no choice, and we will hide well by daylight. Do you carry sharp weapons? Wicked things move by night. Often I see them hopping about the meadow and flying across the clouds. I will find a good cudgel. That must suffice. Eherm gave a non-committal grunt. I will go to market every day. On my way back, I will open the postern, empty the basket, and Bagnold will be deceived. I can do this safely for a week, and by then the trail will be cold. That will mean great risk for you. If Casimir discovered your doing, he would show no mercy. The postern is hidden behind the bush. Who will notice me? I will take care not to be seen. Eilis made a few more half-hearted protests, to which Eherm paid no heed. She looked out over the meadow and across the woodland beyond. In the forest past the village Glimwood live my old father and mother. He is a woodcutter, and their hut is solitary. When we have butter and cheese to spare, I send it to them by my son Colin and the donkey. Tomorrow morning I will bring your smocks, hats, and shoes on my way to market— Tomorrow night, an hour after sunset, I will meet you here, at this spot, and you will sleep in the hay. At sunrise, Colin will be ready, and you will travel to Glimwood. No one will know of your escape, and you may travel by day. Who will connect the Princess Soldrin with three peasants and a donkey? My father and mother will keep you safe until danger is past, and then you shall travel to Trossinet, perhaps by way of De Hout, a longer road, but safer. Eilis said humbly, I do not know how to thank you, at least not until I reach Trossinet, and there I will be able to make my gratitude real. No need for gratitude. If I can steal poor Soldrin away from the tyrant Casimir, I will have reward enough. Tomorrow night, then, an hour after sunset, I will meet you here. Eilis returned to the garden and told Soldrin of Eherm's arrangements. So we do not need to skulk like thieves through the night after all. Tears started from Soldrin's eyes. My dear, faithful Ehem, I never fully appreciated her kindness. From Trossinet we will reward her loyalty. And we still need gold. I must visit my chambers in Hadian. The thought frightens me. It is no great matter. In a twinkling I can slip into the palace and out again. Dusk came to darken the garden. Now, said Soldrin, I will go to Hadian. Eilis rose to his feet. I must go with you, if only to the palace. As you like. Eilis climbed over the wall, unbarred the postern, and Soldrin passed through. For a moment they stood close to the wall. A half-dozen dim lights showed at various levels of the pain hotter. The Urquiel was vacant in the dusk. Soldrin looked down along the arcade. Come. Through the arches, lights twinkled up from Leoness town. The night was warm, the arcades smelled of stone, and occasionally a whiff of ammonia where someone had eased his bladder. At the orangery, the fragrance of flower and fruit overcame all else. Above loomed Hadian, with the glow of candles and lamps outlining its windows, the door into the east tower showed as a half-oval of deep shadow. Soldrin whispered, Best that you wait here. But what if someone comes? Go back to the orangery and wait there. 
Soldrin pressed the latch and pushed at the great iron and timber door. With a groan, it swung open. Soldrin peered through the crack into the octagon. She looked back to Eilis. I'm going in. From the top of the arcade came the sound of voices and the clatter of footsteps. Soldrin pulled Eilis into the palace. Come with me, then. The two crossed the octagon, which was illuminated by a single rack of heavy candles. To the left, an arch opened on the long gallery. Stairs ahead rose to the upper levels. The long gallery was vacant for its whole length. From the respondency came the sound of voices lilting and laughing in gay conversation. Soldrin took Eilis's arm. Come. They ran up the stairs and in short order stood outside Soldrin's chambers. A massive lock joined a pair of hasps riveted into stone and wood. Eilis examined the lock and the door and gave a few half-hearted twists to the lock. We can't get in. The door is too strong. Soldrin took him along the hall to another door, this without a lock. A bedchamber for noble maidens who might be visiting me. She opened the door, listened. No sound. The room smelled of sachet and unguents with an unpleasant overtone of soiled garments. Soldrin whispered, Someone sleeps here, but she is away at her revels. They crossed the room to the window. Soldrin eased open the casement. You must wait here. I've come this way many times when I wanted to avoid Dame Budetta. Eilis looked dubiously toward the door. I hope no one comes in. If so, you must hide in the clothes press or under the bed. I won't be long. She slid out the window, edged along the wide stone coping to her old chamber. She pushed at the casement, forced it open, then jumped down to the floor. The room smelled of dust and long days of emptiness, in sunlight and rain. A trace of perfume still hung in the air, a melancholy recollection of years gone by, and tears came to Soldrin's eyes. She went to the chest where she had stored her possessions. Nothing had been disturbed. She found the secret drawer and pulled it open, Within, so her fingers told her, were those oddments and ornaments, precious gems, gold and silver, which had come into her possession, mostly gifts from visiting kindred. Neither Casimir nor Solace had showered gifts upon their daughter. Soldrin tied the valuables into a scarf. She went to the window and bade farewell to the chamber. Never would she set foot in there again. Of this she felt certain. She returned through the window, pulled tight the casement, and returned to Eilis. They crossed the dark room, opened the door a crack, then stepped out into the dim corridor. Tonight of all nights the palace was busy. Many notables were on hand, and up from the octagon came the sound of voices, and the two could not effect the quick departure upon which they had planned. They looked at each other with wide eyes and pounding hearts. Eilis uttered a soft curse, so now we're trapped. No, whispered Soldrin. We'll go down the back stairs. Don't worry. One way or another we'll escape. Come. They ran light-footed along the corridor, and so began a thrilling game which dealt them a series of frights and startlements, and had been no part of their expectations. Here and there they ran, gliding on soft feet along old corridors, dodging from chamber to chamber, shrinking back into shadows, peering around corners, from the respondency into the chamber of mirrors, up a spiral staircase to the old observatory, across the roof into a high parlor, where young noblefolk held their trysts, then down a service stairs to a long back corridor which gave on a musician's gallery overlooking the Hall of Honors. Candles in the wall sconces were alight. The hall had been made ready for a ceremonial event, perhaps later in the evening. Now the hall stood empty. Stairs led down into a closet which gave on the mauve parlor, so called for the mauve silk upholstery of its chairs and couches, a splendid room with ivory and snuff-colored paneling and a vivid emerald green rug. Eilis and Soldrin ran quietly to the door where they looked out into the long gallery, at this moment empty of human occupancy. It's not far now, 
said Soldrin. First we'll make for the Hall of Honors. Then, if no one appears, we'll make for the Octagon and out the door. With a last look, right and left, the two ran to the arched alcove in which hung the doors into the Hall of Honors. Soldrin looked back the way they had come and clutched Eilis's arm. Someone came out of the library. Quick, inside! They slipped through the doors into the Hall of Honors. They stood wide-eyed, face to face, holding their breaths. Who was it? Eilis whispered. I think it was the priest, Umfred. Perhaps he didn't see us. Perhaps not. If he did, he will be sure to investigate. Come to the back room. I see no back room. Behind the heiress, quick. He's just outside the door. They ran the length of the hall and ducked behind the hanging. Peering through the crack, Eilis saw the far door ease open, slowly, slowly. The portly figure of Brother Umfred was a dark stencil against the lights of the long gallery. For a moment, Brother Umfred stood motionless, save for quick shakes of the head. He seemed to give a cluck of puzzlement and came forward into the room, looking right and left. Soldrin went to the back wall. She found the iron rod and pushed it into the lock holes. Eilis asked in astonishment, What are you doing? Umfred may very well know about this back room. He won't know this other. The door opened, releasing a suffusion of green-purple light. Soldrin whispered, If he comes any closer, we'll hide in here. Eilis, standing by the crack, said, No, he's turning back. He's leaving the hall. Soldrin? I'm in here. It's where the king, my father, keeps covert his private magic. Come look. Eilis went to the doorway, glanced gingerly right and left. Don't be alarmed, said Soldrin. I've been in here before. The little imp is a skack. He's closed in his bottle. I'm sure he'd prefer freedom, but I fear his spite. The mirror is Priscillian. It speaks in season. The cow's horn yields either fresh milk or hydromel, depending on how one holds it. Eilis came slowly forward. The skack glared in annoyance. Colored light motes caught in tubes jerked in excitement. A gargoyle mask hanging high in the shadows turned down a dyspeptic sneer. Eilis spoke in alarm. Come, before we fall afoul of these things. Soldrin said, Nothing has ever done me harm. The mirror knows my name and speaks to me. Magic voices are things of bane. Come, we must leave the palace. One moment, Eilis. The mirror has spoken kindly. Perhaps it will do so again. Priscillian? From the mirror came a melancholy voice. Who calls, Priscillian? It is Soldrin. You spoke to me before and called me by name. Here is my lover, Eilis. Priscillian uttered a groan, then sang in a deep voice and plangent, very slowly, so that each word was distinct. Eilis knew a moonless tide. Soldren saved him death. They joined their souls in wedlock strong to give their son his breath. Eilis, choose from many roads, each veers through toil and blood. But still this night you must be wed to seal your fatherhood. Long have I served King Casimir, he asked me questions three. Yet never will he speak the rote to break me full and free. Eilis, you must take me now and hide me all alone. By Soldren's tree there shall I dwell, beneath the sitting stone. Eilis, as if moving in a dream, reached his hands to Priscillian's frame. He pulled it free of the metal peg which held it to the wall. Eilis held up the mirror and asked in puzzlement, how, this very night, can we be wed? Priscillian's voice, richly full, issued from the mirror. 
You have stolen me from Kazmir. I am yours. That is your first question. You may ask two more. If you ask a fourth, I am free. Very well, as you wish. So how will we be wed? Return to the garden. The way is safe. There your marriage bonds shall be forged. See to it that they are strong and true. Quick, go now. Time presses. You must be gone before Hadian is bolted tight for the night. With no more ado, Soldrin and Eilis departed the secret room, closing tight the door on the seep of green-purple light, Soldrin looked through the crack in the hangings. The Hall of Honors was empty, save for the fifty-four chairs whose personalities had loomed so massively over her childhood. They seemed now shrunken and old, and some of their magnificence had gone. Still, Soldrin felt their brooding contemplation as she and Eilis ran down the hall. The long gallery was empty. The two ran to the octagon and out into the night, they started up the arcade, then made a hurried detour into the orangery, while a quartet of palace guards came stamping, clanking, and cursing down from the Urquil. The steps faded into quiet. Moonlight through the arched intervals cast a succession of pale shapes, alternately silver-gray and darkest black, into the arcade. Across Leoness town, lamps yet flickered, but no sound reached the palace. Soldrin and Eilis slipped from the orangery, ran up under the arcade, and so through the postern into the old garden. Eilis brought Priscillian from under his tunic. Mirror, I have put a question, and I will be sure to put no more until need arises. Now I will not ask how I must hide you, as you directed. Still, if you wished to enlarge upon your previous instructions, I will listen. Priscillian spoke. Hide me now, Eilis, hide me now, down by the old lime tree. Under the sitting stone is a crevice. Hide as well the gold you carry, quick as quick can be. The two descended to the chapel. Eilis went on down the path to the old lime tree. He lifted the sitting stone and found a crevice into which he placed Priscillian and the bag of gold and gems. Soldrin went to the door of the chapel, where she paused to wonder at the candle glow from within. She pushed open the door. Across the room sat Brother Umfrid, dozing at the table. His eyes opened. He looked at Soldrin. Soldrin, you have returned at last. Ah, Soldrin, sweet and wanton, you have been up to mischief. What do you do away from your little domain? Soldrin stood silent in dismay. Brother Umfred lifted his portly torso and came forward. Smiling a winsome smile, eyelids half-closed so that his eyes seemed a trifle askew. He took Soldrin's limp hands. Dearest child... Tell me, where have you been? Soldrin tried to draw back, but Brother Umfred tightened his grip. I went to the palace for a cloak and a gown. Let go of my hands. But Brother Umfred only pulled her closer. His breathing came faster, and his face showed a rosy pink flush. Soldrin, prettiest of all the earth's creatures— do you know that I saw you dancing along the corridors with one of the palace lads? I asked myself, can this be the pure Soldrin, the chaste Soldrin, so pensive and demure? I told myself, impossible, but perhaps she is ardent after all. No, no, breathed Soldrin. She jerked to pull away. Please, let me go. Brother Umfred would not release her. Be kind, Soldrin. I am a man of noble spirit. Still, I am not indifferent to beauty. Long, dearest Soldrin, have I yearned to taste your sweet nectar. 
And remember, my passion is invested in the sanctity of the church. So now, my dearest child, whatever tonight's mischief, it will only have warmed your blood. Embrace me, my golden delight, my sweet mischief, my sly mock purity. Brother Umfred bore her down to the couch. Eilis appeared in the doorway. Soldren saw him and motioned him to stand aside out of sight. She drew up her knees and squirmed away from Brother Umfred. Priest, my father shall hear of your acts. He cares nothing what happens to you, said Brother Umfred thickly. Now be easy, or else I must enforce our Congress by means of pain. Eilis could constrain himself no longer. He stepped forward and dealt Brother Umfred a blow to the side of his head to send him tumbling to the floor. Soldren said in distress, Better Eilis had you remained away, and allowed his beastly lust. First I would kill him. In fact, I will kill him now for his audacity. Brother Umfred dragged himself back against the wall, eyes glistening in the candlelight. Soldren said hesitantly, No, Eilis, I don't want his death. He will report us to the king, Brother Umfred cried out. No, never. I hear a thousand secrets. All are sacred to me, Soldren said thoughtfully. He will witness our wedlock. In fact, he will marry us by the Christian ceremony which is as lawful as any other. Brother Umfred struggled to his feet, blurting incoherent phrases. Eilis told him, Marry us, then, since you are a priest, and do it properly. Brother Umfred took time to settle his cassock and compose himself. Marry you? That is not possible. Certainly it is possible, said Soldren. You have made marriages among the servants. In the chapel at Hadion. This is a chapel. You sanctified it yourself. It has now been profaned. In any case, I can bring the sacraments only to baptized Christians. Then baptize us, and quickly. Brother Umfred smilingly shook his head. First, you must believe truly and become catechumens. And further, King Casimir would be rageful. He would take vengeance on us all. Eilis picked up a stout length of driftwood. Priest, this cudgel supersedes King Casimir. Marry us now, or I will break your head. Soldren took his arm. No, Eilis, we will marry in the manner of the folk, and he shall witness. Then there shall be no talk of who is a Christian and who is not. Brother Umfred again demurred. I cannot be a party to your pagan rite. You must, said Eilis. The two stood by the table and chanted the peasant litany of wedlock. Witness all how we two take the vows of marriage, by this morsel which together we eat. The two divided a crust of bread and ate together. By this water which together we drink. The two drank water from the same cup. By this fire which warms us both. The two passed their hands through the flame of the candle by the blood which we mingle. With a thin bodkin, Eilis pricked Soldren's finger, then his own, and joined the droplets of blood. By the love which binds our hearts together. The two kissed, smiled. So we engage in solemn wedlock, and now declare ourselves man and wife, in accordance with the laws of man and the benevolent grace of nature. Eilis took up pen, ink, and a sheet of parchment. Write, priest, tonight on this date I have witnessed the marriage of Soldren and Eilis, and sign your name. With shaking hands, Brother Umfred pushed away the pen. I fear the wrath of King Casimir. Priest, fear me more. In anguish, Brother Umfred wrote as he was instructed. Now let me go my way so that you may hurry to tell all to King Casimir? Eilis shook his head. No. Fear nothing, cried Brother Umfred. I am as silent as the grave. I know a thousand secrets. Swear, 
said Soldrin. Down on your knees, kiss the sacred book you carry in your pouch, and swear that by your hope of salvation, and by your fear of perpetual hell, that you will reveal nothing of what you have seen and heard and done tonight. Brother Umfrid, now sweating and ashen-faced, looked from one to the other. Slowly he went to his knees, kissed his book of gospels, and swore his oath. He struggled to his feet. I have witnessed, I have sworn, it is my right to now depart. No, said Eilis somberly, I do not trust you. I fear that spite may overwhelm your honor and so destroy us. It is a chance I cannot accept. Brother Umfrid was momentarily speechless with indignation. But I have sworn by everything holy, and so as easily you might forswear them, and so be purged of the sin. Should I kill you in cold blood? No, then I must do something else with you. The three stood staring at each other, frozen a moment in time. Eilis stirred. Priest, wait here, and do not try to leave, on pain of good strokes of the cudgel, as we shall be just outside the door. Eilis and Soldrin went out into the night, to halt a few yards from the chapel door. Eilis spoke in a husky half-whisper, for fear Brother Umfrid might have his ear pressed to the door. The priest cannot be trusted. I agree, said Soldrin. He is as quick as an eel. Still, I cannot kill him. We can't tie him or immure him, for Ehem to tend, since then her help would become known. I can think of a single plan— we must part. At this moment I will take him from the garden. We will proceed east. No one will trouble to notice us. We are not fugitives. I will make sure that he neither escapes nor cries out for succor. A vexing and tedious task, but it must be done. In a week or two I will leave him while he sleeps. I will make my way to Glimwood and seek you out, and all will be as we planned." Soldrin put her arms around Eilis and laid her head on his chest. Must we be parted? There is no other way to be secure, save killing the man dead, which I cannot do in cold blood. I will take a few pieces of gold, you take the rest, and Priscillian as well. Tomorrow, an hour after sunset, go to Eherm, and she will send you to her father's hut, and there shall I seek you out. Go you now to the lime tree, and bring me back a few small trinkets of gold to trade for food and drink. I'll stay to guard the priest. Soldrin ran down the path and a moment later returned with the gold. They went to the chapel. Brother Umfred stood by the table, looking morosely into the fire. Priest, said Eilis, you and I are to make a journey. Turn your back, if you will. I must bind your arms so that you perform no unseasonable antics. Obey me, and you will come to no harm. What of my convenience? blurted Brother Umfred. You should have considered that before you came here tonight. Turn around, doff your cassock, and put your arms behind you. Instead, Brother Umfred sprang at Eilis and struck him with the cudgel he likewise had taken from the woodpile. Eilis stumbled back. Brother Umfred sent Soldrin reeling. He ran from the chapel, up the path, with Eilis after him, through the postern and out onto the Urquil, bellowing at the top of his voice, Guards! To me! Help! Treason! Murder! Help! To me! Seize the traitor! Up from the arcade trooped a company of four, the same which Eilis and Soldrin had avoided by stepping into the orangery. They ran forward to seize both Umfrid and Eilis. What goes on here? Why this horrid outcry? Call King Casimir, bawled Brother Umfrid. Waste not an instant. This vagabond has troubled the Princess Soldrin. A terrible deed. Bring King Casimir, I say. On the run! King Casimir was brought to the scene, and Brother Umford excitedly made an explanation. I saw them in the palace. I recognized the princess, and I have also seen this man. He is a vagabond of the streets. I followed them here, and imagine the audacity. They wanted me to marry them by the Christian rite. I refused with all spirit, and warned them of their crime. 
Soldren, standing by the postern, came forward. Sire, be not angry with us. This is Eilis. We are husband and wife. We love each other dearly. Please give us leave to live our lives in tranquility. If you so choose, we will go from Hadian and never return. Brother Umfred, still excited by his role in the affair, would not be still. They threatened me. I am almost bereft of reason through their malice. They forced me to witness their wedlock. If I had not signed to the ceremony, they would have broken my head. Casimir spoke icily. Silence! Enough! I will deal with you later. He gave an order. Bring me Zerling. He turned to Soldren. In times of rage or excitement, Casimir kept his voice always even and neutral, and he did so now. You seem to have disobeyed my command. Whatever your reason, it is far from sufficient. Soldren said softly, You are my father. Have you no concern for my happiness? I am king of Lyonesse. Whatever my one-time feelings, they were dispelled by the disregard for my wishes, of which you know. Now I find you consorting with a nameless bumpkin. So be it. My anger is not diminished. You shall return to the garden and there abide. Go! Shoulders sagging, Soldren went to the postern, through and down into the garden, King Casimir turned to appraise Eilis. Your presumption is amazing. You shall have ample time to reflect upon it. Zerling! Where is Zerling? Sire, I am here. A squat, slope-shouldered man, bald with a brown beard and round, staring eyes, came forward. Zerling, King Casimir's chief executioner, the most dreaded man of Leoness town, next to Casimir himself. King Casimir spoke a word into his ear. Zerling put a halter around Eilis's neck and led him across the Urquil, then around and behind the pain hotter. By the light of the half-moon, the halter was removed and a rope was tied around Eilis's chest. He was lifted over a stone verge and lowered into a hole, down, down, down. Finally, his feet struck the bottom. In a succinct gesture of finality, the rope was dropped in after him. There was no sound in the darkness. The air smelled of dank stone with a taint of human decay. For five minutes, Isla stood staring up the shaft. Then he groped to one of the walls a distance of perhaps seven feet. His foot encountered a hard, round object— Reaching down, he discovered a skull. Moving to the side, Eilis sat down with his back to the wall. After a period, fatigue weighted his eyelids. He became drowsy. He fought off sleep as best he could for fear of awakening. At last, he slept. He awoke, and his fears were justified. Upon recollection, he cried out in disbelief and anguish, how could such tragedy be possible? Tears flooded his eyes. He bent his head into his arms and wept. An hour passed while he sat hunched in pure misery. Light seeped down the shaft. He was able to discern the dimensions of his cell. The floor was a circular area about fourteen feet in diameter, flagged with heavy slabs of stone. The stone walls rose vertically six feet, then funneled up to the central shaft, which entered the cell about twelve feet over the floor. Against the far wall, bones and skulls had been piled. Eilis counted ten skulls, and others perhaps were hidden under the pile of bones. Near to where he sat lay another skeleton, evidently the last occupant of the cell. Eilis rose to his feet. He went to the center of the chamber and looked up the shaft. High above, he saw a disk of blue sky, so airy, wind-swept and free, that again tears came to his eyes. He considered the shaft. The diameter was about five feet. It was cased in rough stone and rose sixty or even seventy feet. Exact judgment was difficult, above the point where it entered the chamber. Eilis turned away. 
On the walls, previous occupants had scratched names and sad mottos. The most recent occupant, on the wall above his skeleton, had scratched a schedule of names to the number of twelve ranked in a column, Eyeless, too dispirited to feel interest in anything but his own woes, turned away. The cell was unfurnished, the rope lay in a loose heap under the shaft. Near the bone pile he noticed the rotted remains of other ropes, garments, ancient leather buckles and straps. The skeleton seemed to watch him from the empty eye sockets of its skull, Eyeless dragged it to the bone pile and turned the skull so that it could see only the wall. Then he sat down. An inscription on the wall opposite caught his attention. Newcomer, welcome to our brotherhood. Eyeless grunted and turned his attention elsewhere. So began the period of his incarceration. Chapter 12 King Casimir dispatched an envoy to Tinsin Fyral, who in due course returned with an ivory tube, from which the chief herald extracted a scroll. He read to King Casimir, Noble sir, as ever my respectful compliments, I am pleased to learn of your impending visit. Be assured that our welcome will be appropriate to your regal person and distinguished retinue, which, so I suggest, should number no more than eight, since at Tinsin Fyral we lack the expansive grace of Hadian. Again, my most cordial salute, Fode Carfilio, Vale Evander, the Duke. King Casimir immediately rode north with a retinue of twenty knights, ten servants, and three camp wagons. The first night the company halted at Duke Baldred's castle, Twanic. On the second day they rode north through the Troag, a chaos of pinnacles and defiles. On the third day they crossed the border into South Ulfland. Halfway through the afternoon, at the gates of Cerberus, the cliffs closed in to constrict the way— which was blocked by the fortress called Bukach. The garrison consisted of a dozen raggle-taggle soldiers and a commander who found banditry less profitable than exacting tolls from travelers. At a challenge from the sentry, the cavalcade from Leoness halted, while the soldiers of the garrison, blinking and scowling under steel caps, slouched out upon the battlements. The knight Sir Welty rode forward, Halt, called the commander. Lame your names, your origin, destination, and purpose, so that we may reckon the lawful toll. We are noblemen in the service of King Casimir of Leoness. We ride to visit the Duke of Vale Evander at his invitation, and we are exempt from toll. No one is exempt from toll, save only King Oriante and the great god Mithra, you must pay ten silver florins. Sir Welty rode back to confer with Casimir, who thoughtfully appraised the fort. Pay, said King Casimir. We will deal with these scoundrels on our return. Sir Welty returned to the fort and contemptuously tossed a pack of coins to the captain. Pass, gentlemen. Two by two the company rode by call Bukach, and that night rested on a meadow beside the south fork of the Evander. At noon of the following day the troop halted before Tinsin Fyral, where it surmounted a tall crag as if growing from the substance of the crag itself. King Casimir and eight of his knights rode forward. The others turned aside and set up a camp beside the Evander. A herald came out from the castle and addressed King Casimir, Sir, I bring Duke Carfilio's compliments, and his request that you follow me. We ride a crooked road up the side of the crag, but have no concern. The danger is only to enemies. I will lead the way. As the troop proceeded, the stench of carrion came on the breeze. In the middle distance, the Evander flowed across a green meadow, where rose an array of twenty poles, half supporting impaled corpses— that is hardly a welcoming sight, King Casimir told the herald. Sir, it reminds the duke's enemies that his patience is not inexhaustible. 
King Casimir shrugged, offended not so much by Carfilio's acts as by the odor. At the base of the crag waited an honor guard of four knights in ceremonial plate armor, and Casimir wondered how Carfilio knew so closely the hour of his coming. A signal from Call Bacatch? Spies at Hadian? Casimir, who had never been able to introduce spies into Tinsin Fyral, frowned at the thought. The cavalcade mounted the crag by a road cut into the rock, which finally, high in the air, turned under a portcullis into the castle's forecourt. Duke Carfilio came forward. King Casimir dismounted, the two pressed each other in a formal embrace. "'Sir, I am delighted by your visit,' said Carfilio. "'I have arranged no suitable festivities, but not from any lack of goodwill. In truth, you gave me too short notice.' I am perfectly suited, said King Casimir. I am not here for frivolity. Rather, I hope to explore once more matters of mutual advantage. Excellent. That is always a topic of interest. This is your first visit to Tinsin Firel, is it not? I saw it as a young man, but from a distance. It is beyond question a mighty fortress. Indeed. We command four important roads, to Lyoness, to Is, over the Ulfish Moors, and the border road north to De Hout. We are self-sufficient. I have driven a well deep through solid stone into a flowing aquifer. We maintain supplies for years of siege. Four men could hold the access road against a thousand, or a million. I consider the castle impregnable. I am inclined to agree, said Casimir. Still, what of the saddle? If a force occupied the mountain yonder, conceivably it might bring siege engines to bear. Carfilio turned to inspect the heights to the north, which were connected to the crag by a saddle, as if he had never before noticed this particular vista. So it would seem. But you are not alarmed. Carfilio laughed, showing perfect white teeth. My enemies have reflected long and well on Breakback Ridge. As for the saddle, I have my little wiles. King Casimir nodded. The view is exceptionally fine. True. On a clear day from my high workroom, I scan the entire vale from here to Is. But now you must refresh yourself, and then we can take up our conversation." Casimir was conducted to a set of high chambers overlooking Vale of Ander, a view across twenty miles of soft green landscape to a far glint of sea. Air, fresh save for an occasional cloying taint, blew through the open windows. Casimir thought of Carfilio's dead enemies on the meadow below, each silent on his own pole. An image flickered through his mind, Soldren, pallid and drawn here at Tinsin Firel, breathing the putrid air. He thrust away the picture. The affair was over and done. Two bare-chested black Moorish boys wearing turbans of purple silk, red pantaloons and sandals with spiral toes, helped him with his bath, then dressed him in silk small clothes and a tawny buff robe decorated with black rosettes. Casimir descended to the great hall, past an enormous aviary where birds of many colored plumage flew from branch to branch. Carfilio awaited him in the great hall. The two men seated themselves on divans and were served frozen fruit sherbet in silver cups. Excellent, said Casimir. Your hospitality is pleasant. It is informal, and I hope that you will not be supremely bored, murmured Carfilio. Casimir put aside the ice. I have come here to discuss a matter of importance. He glanced at the servants. Carfilio waved them from the room. Proceed. Casimir leaned back in his chair. King Granis recently sent out a diplomatic mission on one of his new warships. They put into Blaylock, Pomperel, De Hout, Klugga in Godelia, and Is. The emissaries decried my ambitions and proposed an alliance to defeat me. They won only lukewarm support, if any, even though— Casimir smiled a cold smile. I have made no attempt to disguise my intentions. 
Each hopes the others will fight the battle. Each wishes to be the single kingdom unmolested. Granis, I am sure, expected no more. He wanted to assert both his leadership and his command of the sea. In this he succeeded very well. His ship destroyed a scar vessel, which at once changes our perceptions of the scar. They can no longer be considered invincible, and Troy's sea power is magnified. They paid a price, losing the commander and one of the two royal princes aboard. For me the message is clear. The Troyce becomes stronger. I must strike and cause a dislocation. The obvious place is South Ulfland, from where I can attack the Scar in North Ulfland, before they consolidate their holdings. Once I take the fortress Politets, de Hout is at my mercy. Audrey cannot fight me from both west and south. First, then, to take South Ulfland with maximum facility, which presupposes your cooperation. Casimir paused. Carfilio, looking thoughtfully into the fire, made no immediate response. The silence became uncomfortable. Carfilio stirred and said, You have, as you know, my personal well wishes, but I am not altogether a free agent, and I must conduct myself with circumspection. Indeed, said Casimir. You apparently do not refer to your nominal liege lord King Orienti. Definitely not. Who, may I ask, are the enemies you are so pointedly trying to dissuade? Carfilio made a motion. I agree, the stench is appalling. Those are rogues of the moors. Petty barons, ten tuffed lords, little better than bandits, so that an honest man takes his life in his hands to ride out across the fells for a day's hunting. South Ulfland is essentially lawless, save for Vey Levander. Poor Orianti can't dominate his wife, much less a kingdom. Every clan chieftain fancies himself an aristocrat and builds a mountain fortress from which he raids his neighbors. I have attempted to bring order a thankless job. I am styled a despot and an ogre. Harshness, however, is the only language these highland brutes understand. These are the enemies who cause your circumspection? No. Carfilio rose to his feet and went to stand with his back to the fire. He looked down at Casimir with cool dispassion. In all candor, here are the facts. I am a student of magic. I am taught by the great Tamurello, and I am under obligation, so that I must refer to him matters of policy. That is the situation. Casimir stared up into Carfilio's eyes. When may I expect your response? Why wait? asked Carfilio. Let us settle the matter now. Come. The two climbed to Carfilio's workroom, Casimir now quiet, alert, and alive with interest. Carfilio's apparatus was almost embarrassingly scant. Even Casimir's trifles were impressive by contrast. Perhaps, Casimir speculated, Carfilio kept the larger part of his equipment stored in cabinets. A large map of Hybris, carved in various woods, dominated all else, in both size and evident importance. In a panel at the back of the map had been carved a face, the semblance, so it seemed, of Tamurello, in crude and exaggerated outlines. The craftsman had been at no pains to flatter Tamurello. The forehead bulged over protruding eyes, cheeks and lips were painted a particularly unpleasant red. Carfilio pointedly offered no explanations. He pulled at the earlobe of the image— Tamurello, hear the voice of Fode Carfilio. He touched the mouth. Tamurello, speak. In a wooden croak, the mouth said, I hear and speak. Carfilio touched the eyes. Tamurello, look upon me and King Casimir of Lyoness. We are considering the use of his armies in South Ulfland to quell disorder and to extend King Casimir's wise rule.
We understand your policy of detachment. Still, we ask your advice. The image spoke. I advise no alien troops in South Ulfland, most especially the armies of Leoness. King Casimir, your goals do you credit, but they would unsettle all Hybris, including de Hout, to bring inconvenience upon me. I advise that you return to Leoness and make peace with Trocinet. Carfilio, I advise that you decisively use the might of Tinsin Fyral to bar incursions into South Oldland. Thank you, spoke Carfilio. We will surely take your advice to heart. Casimir said no word. Together they descended to the parlor, where for an hour they spoke courteously of small subjects. Casimir declared himself ready for his bed, and Carfilio wished him a comfortable night's sleep. In the morning, King Casimir rose early, expressed gratitude to Carfilio for his hospitality, and with no further ado, made his departure. At noon, the party approached Call Bacatch. King Casimir, with half of his knights, passed the fort after paying a toll of eight silver florins. A few yards along the road they halted. The rest of the party approached the fortress. The captain of the fortress stepped forward. Why did you not pass altogether? It is now necessary that you pay another eight florins. Sir Welty dismounted without haste. He seized the captain and held a knife to his throat. Which will you be, a dead ulfish cutthroat, or a live soldier in the service of King Casimir of Leoness? The captain's steel hat fell off, his bald brown pate bobbed as he writhed and struggled. He gasped, This is treachery! Where is honor? Look yonder, there sits King Casimir. Do you accuse him of dishonor, after mulcting him of his royal money? Naturally not. Still, Sir Welty pricked him with the knife. Order your men out for inspection. You will cook over a slow fire if a drop of blood other than your own is spilled. The captain attempted a final defiance. You expect me to deliver our impregnable catch into your hands without so much as a protest? Protest all you like. In fact, I'll let you go back within. Then you are under siege. We will climb the cliff and drop boulders on the battlements. Possible, perhaps, but very difficult. We will fire logs and thrust them into the passage. They shall blaze and smolder. You will smoke and bake as the heat spreads. Do you defy the might of Leoness? The captain heaved a deep breath. Of course not. As I declared from the very first, I gladly enter the service of the most gracious King Casimir. Ho, oh, guards, out for inspection. Glumly, the garrison filed out to stand scowling and disheveled in the sunlight, hair tousled under their steel caps. Casimir looked them over with contempt. It might be easier to lop off their heads. Have no fear, cried the captain. We are the smartest of troops under ordinary circumstances. King Casimir shrugged and turned away. The fortress tolls were loaded into one of the wagons. Sir Welty and fourteen knights remained as a temporary garrison, and King Casimir joylessly returned to Leoness town. In his workroom at Tinsin Fyral, Carfilio once again engaged the attention of Tamurello. Casimir has departed. Our relationship is at best formally polite. The very optimum. Kings, like children, tend to be opportunistic. Generosity only spoils them. They equate affability with weakness and hasten to exploit it. Casimir's temperament is even less pleasant. He is as single-minded as a fish. I saw him spontaneous only here in my workroom. He is interested in magic and has ambitions in this direction. For Casimir, forever futile. He lacks the patience, and here he is much like yourself. Possibly true. 
I am anxious to proceed into the first extensions. The situation is as before. The field of analogues must be like a second nature to you. How long can you fix an image in your mind, then change its colors at will while holding fixed lineaments? I am not proficient. These images should be hard as rocks. Upon conceiving a landscape, you must be able to count the leaves on a tree, then recount to the same number. That is a difficult exercise. Why can't I merely work the apparatus? Aha! Where will you obtain this apparatus? Despite my love for you, I can part with none of my hard-won operators. Still, one can always contrive new apparatus. Indeed, I would be glad to learn this hermetic and abstruse secret. Still, you agree it is possible, but difficult. Sandestins are no longer innocent, nor plentiful, nor accommodating. Eh! Ha! This was a sudden exclamation. Tamurello spoke in a changed voice. A thought occurs to me. It's so beautiful a thought that I hardly dare to think it. Tell me this thought. Tamurello's silence was that of a man engaged in a complex calculation. Finally, he said, It is a dangerous thought. I could neither advocate nor even suggest such a thought. Tell me the thought. Even so much is to join in its implementation. It must be a dangerous thought indeed. True. Let us pass on to safer subjects. I might make this mischievous observation. One way to secure magical apparatus is, in blunt language, to rob another magician who thereupon may become too feeble to avenge the predation, especially if he does not know its perpetrator. So far I follow you closely. What then? Suppose one were to rob a magician. Who would he choose to victimize? Mergen? Me? Bibelidus? Never. The consequences would be certain, swift, and awful. One would seek a novice still fresh to his lore, and preferably one with an amplitude of equipment, so that the theft yields a good return. Also, the victim should be one whom he perceives as an enemy of the future. The time to weaken or even destroy that person is now. I speak, of course, in the purest of hypothetical terms. For the purposes of illustration, and still hypothetically, who might such a person be? Tamurello could not bring himself to utter a name. Even hypothetical contingencies must be explored down several levels, and whole areas of duplicity must be arranged. We will talk more of this later. Meanwhile, not a word to anyone else. Chapter 13 Shimrod, scion of Mergen the Magician, early demonstrated an inner impulse of extraordinary strength, and in due course wandered beyond Mergen's control into autonomy. The two were not obviously similar, save for competence, resource, and a certain immoderacy of imagination, which in Shimrod evinced itself as an antic humor and a sometimes painful capacity for sentiment. In appearance, the two were even less alike. Mergen revealed himself as a strong, white-haired man of indefinable age. Shimrod appeared as a young man, with an almost ingenuous expression. He was spare, long of leg, with sandy buff hair and hazel gray eyes. His jaw was long, his cheeks somewhat concave, his mouth wide and twisted as if at some wry reflection. After a time of loose-footed wandering, Shimrod took up residence at Trilda, a manse on Lally Meadow, formerly occupied by Mergen in the forest of Tontreval, 
and there settled himself to the serious study of magic, using the books, patterns, apparatus, and operators which Mergen had given into his custody. Trilda was a congenial seat for intensive study. The air smelled fresh of foliage, the sun shone by day, the moon and stars by night. Solitude was near absolute. Ordinary folk seldom ventured so deep into the forest. Trilda had been built by Hilario, a minor magician of many quaint fancies. The rooms were seldom square and overlooked Lally Meadow through bay windows of many sizes and shapes. The steep roof, in addition to six chimneys, disposed itself in innumerable dormers, gables, ridges, and the highest verge supported a black iron weathercock, which served in double stead as a ghost chaser. Mergen had dammed the brook to create a pond. The overflow turned a wheel beside the workroom where it powered a dozen different machines, including a lathe and a bellows for his hot fire. Halflings occasionally came to the edge of the forest to watch Shimrod when he went out on the meadow, but otherwise ignored him for fear of his magic. The seasons passed, autumn turned to winter, flakes of snow drifted down from the sky to shroud the meadow in silence. Shimrod kept his fires crackling and began an intensive study of Balbury's abstracts and excerpts, a vast compendium of exercises, methods, forms, and patterns inscribed in antique or even imaginary languages. Using a lens fashioned from a Sandestin's eye, Shimrod read these inscriptions as if they were plain tongue. Shimrod took his meals from a cloth of bounty, which, when spread on a table, produced a toothsome feast. For entertainment, he schooled himself in the use of the lute, a skill appreciated by fairies of Tudifat Shi, at the opposite end of Lally Meadow, who loved music, though no doubt for the wrong reasons. Fairies constructed viols, guitars, and grass pipes of fine quality, but their music at best was a plaintive, undisciplined sweetness, like the sound of distant wind chimes. At worst, they made a clangor of unrelated stridencies, which they could not distinguish from their best. Withal, they were the vainest of the vain. Fairy musicians, discovering that a human passerby has chanced to hear them, invariably inquired how he had enjoyed the music. And woe betide the graceless churl who spoke his mind, for then he was set to dancing for a period comprising a week, a day, an hour, a minute, and a second, without pause. However, should the listener declare himself enraptured, he might well be rewarded by the vain and gloating halfling. Often, when Shimrod played his lute, he found fairy creatures, large and small, sitting on the fence, bundled in green coats with red scarves and peaked hats. Fairies maintain no specific size indefinitely. When dealing with men, they often appear the size of children, seldom larger. When caught unawares, they seem on occasion only four inches to a foot tall. The fairies themselves take no heed of size. Fairies share with humans the qualities of malice, spite, treachery, envy, and ruthlessness. They lack the equally human traits of clemency, kindness, pity. The fairy sense of humor never amuses its victim. If he acknowledged their presence, they offered fulsome approbation and asked for more music. On certain occasions, fairy horn players asked to play along with him. Each time, Shimrod made polite refusal. If he allowed such a duet, he might find himself playing forever. By day, by night, across the meadow, in the treetops, higgledy-piggledy through thorn and thicket, across the moors, underground in the shees. The secret, so Shimrod knew, was never to accept the fairy's terms, but always to close the deal on one's own stipulations, otherwise the bargain was sure to turn sour. One of those who listened as Shimrod played was a beautiful fairy maiden with flowing nut-brown hair. Shimrod tried to lure her into his house with the offer of sweetmeats. One day she approached and stood looking at him, mouth curved, eyes glinting with mischief. 
And why would you wish me inside that great house of yours? Shall I be truthful? I would hope to make love to you. Ah, but that is sweetness you should never try to taste, for you might become mad and follow me forever making vain entreaties. Vain, always and always, and you would cruelly deny me? Perhaps. What if you discovered that warm human love was more pleasing than your bird-like fairy couplings? Then who would beseech and who would follow whom forever, making the vain entreaties of a lovesick fairy maid? The fairy screwed up her face in puzzlement. That concept has never occurred to me. Then come inside and we shall see. First I will pour you wine of pomegranates, then we will slip from our clothes and warm our skins by firelight. And then? Then we will make the test to learn whose love is the warmer. The fairy maiden pulled her mouth together in a pout of mock outrage. I should not flaunt before a stranger, but I am no stranger. Even now, when you look at me, you melt with love. I am frightened. Quickly she retreated, and Shimrod saw her no more. Spring arrived. The snows melted, and flowers bedizened the meadow. One sunny morning, Shimrod left his manse and wandered the meadow, rejoicing in the flowers, the bright green foliage, the bird calls, he discovered a track leading north into the forest, which he never before had noticed. Under the oaks, thick bold with sprawling branches, he followed the trail. Back, forth, over a hillock, down into a dark glen, then up and through a clearing, walled with tall silver birches, sprinkled with blue cornflowers. The way led up over an outcrop of black rocks, and now, through the forest, Shimrod heard laments and outcries, punctuated by a reverberant thudding sound. Shimrod ran light-footed through the woods to discover among the rocks a tarn of black-green water. To the side, a long-bearded troll, with an extravagantly large cudgel, beat a lank furry creature hanging like a rug on a line between a pair of trees. With every blow, the creature cried out for mercy, Stop! No more! You are breaking my bones! Have you no pity? You have mistaken me, this is clear. My name is Grofinet. No more! Use logic and reason! Shimrod moved forward. Stop the blows. The troll, five feet tall and burly, jumped around in surprise. He lacked a neck. His head rested directly on the shoulders. He wore a dirty jerkin and trousers, a leather codpiece encased a set of very large genitals. Shimrod sauntered forward. Why must you beat poor Grofinet? Why does one do anything? growled the troll. From a sense of purpose, for the sake of a job well done. That is a good response, but it leaves many questions unanswered said Shimrod. Possibly so, but no matter. Be off with you. I wish to thrash this bastard hybrid of two bad dreams. It is all a mistake, bawled Grafinet. It must be resolved before damage is done. Lower me to the ground where we can talk calmly without prejudice. The troll struck out with his cudgel. Silence! In a frantic spasm, Grafinet won free of the bonds. He scrambled about the clearing on long, big-footed legs, hopping and dodging, while the troll chased after with his cudgel. Shimrod stepped forward and pushed the troll into the tarn. A few oily bubbles rose to the surface, and the tarn was once more smooth. "'Sir, that was a deft act,' said Grafinet. "'I am in your debt.' Shimrod spoke modestly. Truly no great matter. I regret that I must defer with you. Quite rightly, said Shimrod. I spoke without thinking, and now I will bid you good day. One moment, sir. May I ask as to whom I am indebted? I am Shimrod. I live at Trilda, a mile or so through the forest. 
surprising. Few men of the human race visit these parts alone. I am a magician of sorts, said Shimrod. The halflings avoid me. He looked Graffinette up and down. I must say that I have never seen another like you. What is your sort? Graffinette replied in a rather lofty manner. That is a topic which gentlefolk seldom see fit to discuss. My apologies. I intended no vulgarity. Once again, I bid you good day. I will conduct you to Trilda, said Graffinette. These are dangerous parts. It is the least I can do. As you wish. The two returned to Lally Meadow. Shimrod halted. You need come no farther. Trilda is only a few steps yonder. As we walked, said Graffinette, I pondered. It came to me that I am much in your debt. Say nothing more, declared Shimrod. I am happy to have been of help. That is easy for you to say, but the burden weighs on my pride. I am forced to declare myself in your service until the score is settled. Do not refuse. I am adamant. You need provide only my food and shelter. I will take responsibility for tasks which otherwise might distract you and even perform minor magics. Ah, you are also a magician? An amateur of the art, little more. You may instruct me further if you like. After all, two trained minds are better than one. And never forget security. When a person intently looks forward, he leaves his backside unguarded. Shimrod could not shake Graffinette's resolution, and Graffinette became a member of the household. At first, Graffinette and his activities were a distraction. Ten times in the first week, Shimrod paused on the very verge of sending Graffinette away, but always drew back in the face of Graffinette's virtues, which were notable. Graffinette caused no irregularities and disturbed none of Shimrod's properties. He was remarkably tidy and never out of sorts. Indeed, Graffinette's high spirits caused the distractions. His mind was fertile and his enthusiasms came one upon the other. For the first few days, Graffinette conducted himself with exaggerated diffidence. Even so, while Shimrod strained to memorize the interminable lists in The Order of Mutables, Graffinette loped about the house talking to imaginary, or at least invisible, companions. Presently, Shimrod's exasperation became amusement, and he found himself looking forward to Graffinette's next outbreak of foolishness. One day, Shimrod waved a fly from his work table. At once, Graffinette became the vigilant enemy of flies, moths, bees, and other winged insects, allowing them no trespass. Unable to catch them, he opened wide the front door, then herded the individual insect to the outdoors. Meanwhile, a dozen others entered. Shimrod noticed Graffinette's efforts and worked a small bane upon Trilda, which sent every insect fleeing post-haste from the house. Graffinette was greatly pleased by his success. At last, bored with boasting of his triumph over the insects, Graffinette developed a new caprice— he spent several days contriving wings of withe and yellow silk, which he strapped to his lank torso. Looking from his window, Shimrod watched him running across Lally Meadow, flapping his wings and bounding into the air, hoping to fly like a bird. Shimrod was tempted to lift Graffinette by magic and flit him aloft. He controlled the whimsy, lest Graffinette become dangerously elated and bring himself to harm. Later in the afternoon, Graffinette attempted a great bound and fell into Lally Water. The fairies of Tadafat Shi spent themselves in immoderate glee, rolling and tumbling, kicking their legs into the air. Graffinette threw aside the wings in disgust and limped back to Trilda. Graffinette next gave himself to the study of the Egyptian pyramids. They are extraordinarily fine and a credit to the pharaohs declared Graffinette. Exactly so. On the next morning, Graffinette spoke further on the subject. These mighty monuments are fascinating in their simplicity. True. I wonder what might be their scope. Shimrod shrugged. A hundred yards to the side, more or less, or so I suppose. 
Later, Shimrod observed Graffinet pacing out dimensions along Lally Meadow. He called out, What are you doing? Nothing of consequence. I hope you are not planning to build a pyramid. It would block the sunlight. Graffinet paused in his pacing. Perhaps you are right. He reluctantly suspended his plans, but quickly discovered a new interest— during the evening, Shimrod came into the parlor to light the lamps. Graffinet stepped from the shadows. Now then, Sir Shimrod, did you see me as you passed? Shimrod's mind had been elsewhere, and Graffinet had stood somewhat back past his range of vision. For a fact, said Shimrod, I utterly failed to see you. In that case, said Graffinet, I have learned the technique of invisibility. Wonderful. What is your secret? I use the force of sheer will to put myself beyond perception. I must learn this method. Intellectual thrust, pure and simple, is the key, said Graffinet, and added the warning. If you fail, don't be disappointed. It is a difficult feat. We shall see. The following day, Graffinet experimented with his new slight. Shimrod would call... Graffinet, where are you? Have you gone invisible again? Whereupon Graffinet would step from a corner of the room in triumph. One day Graffinet suspended himself from the ceiling beams of the workroom on a pair of straps to hang as if in a hammock. Shimrod, upon entering the room, might have noticed nothing, except that Graffinet had neglected to put up his tail, which dangled into the middle of the room, terminating in a tuft of tawny fur. Graffinet at last decided to put by all his previous ambitions and to become a magician in earnest. To this end, he frequented the workroom to watch Shimrod at his manipulations. He was, however, intensely afraid of fire whenever Shimrod, for one reason or another, excited a tongue of flame. Graffinet bounded from the room in a panic, and at last put by his plans to become a magician. Midsummer's Eve drew near. Coincidentally, a series of vivid dreams came to disturb Shimrod's sleep. The landscape was always the same, a terrace of white stone overlooking a beach of white sand and a calm blue sea beyond. A marble balustrade enclosed the terrace, and low surf broke into foam along the beach. In the first dream, Shimrod leaned on the balustrade, idly surveying the sea. Along the beach came walking a dark-haired maiden, in a sleeveless smock of a soft gray-brown cloth. As she approached, Shimrod saw that she was slender and an inch or so taller than medium stature. Black hair, caught in a twist of dark red twine, hung almost to her shoulders— her arms and bare feet were graceful, her skin was a pale olive. Shimrod thought her exquisitely beautiful, with an added quality which included both mystery and a kind of provocation that, rather than overt, was implicit in her very existence. As she passed, she turned Shimrod a somber half-smile, neither inviting nor forbidding, then went along the beach and out of sight. Shimrod stirred in his sleep and awoke. The second dream was the same, except that Shimrod called to the maiden and invited her to the terrace. She hesitated, smilingly shook her head, and passed on. On the third night, she halted and spoke. Why do you call me, Shimrod? I want you to stop and at least talk with me. The maiden demurred. I think not. I know very little of men, and I am frightened, for I feel a strange impulse when I pass by. On the fourth night, the maiden in the dream paused, hesitated, then slowly approached the terrace. Shimrod stepped down to meet her, but she halted, and Shimrod found that he could approach her no more closely, which in the context of the dream seemed not unnatural. He asked, Today will you speak to me? I know of nothing to tell you. Why do you walk the beach? Because it pleases me. 
Whence do you come and where do you go? I am a creature of your dreams. I walk in and out of thought. Dream thing or not, come closer and stay with me. Since the dream is mine, you must obey. That is not the nature of dreams. As she turned away, she looked over her shoulder, and when at last Shimrod awoke, he remembered the exact quality of her expression. Enchantment. But to what purpose? Shimrod walked out on the meadow, considering the situation from every conceivable aspect. A sweet enticement was being laid upon him by subtle means, and no doubt to his eventual disadvantage. Who might work such a spell? Shimrod cast among the persons known to him, but none would seem to have reason to beguile him with so strangely beautiful a maiden. He returned to the workroom and tried to cast a portent, but the necessary detachment failed him and the portent broke into a spatter of discordant colors. He sat late in the workroom that night while a cool, dark wind sighed through the trees at the back of the manse. The prospect of sleep brought him both misgivings and an uneasy tingle of anticipation which he tried to quell, but which persisted nevertheless. Very well, then, Shimrod told himself in a surge of bravado, let us face up to the matter and discover where it leads. He took himself to his couch. Sleep was slow in coming. For hours he twitched through a troubled doze, sensitive to every fancy which chose to look into his mind. At last he slept. The dream came presently. Shimrod stood on the terrace. Along the beach came the maiden, bare-armed and barefooted, her black hair blowing in the sea wind. She approached without haste. Shimrod waited imperturbably, leaning on the balustrade. To show impatience was poor policy, even in a dream. The maiden drew near. Shimrod descended the wide marble stairs. The wind died, and also the surf. The dark-haired maiden halted and stood waiting. Shimrod moved closer, and a waft of perfume reached him the odor of violets. The two stood only a yard apart. He might have touched her. She looked into his face, smiling her pensive half-smile. She spoke, Shimrod, I may visit you no more. What is to stay you? My time is short. I must go to a place behind the star Akernar. Is this of your own will where you would go? I am enchanted. Tell me how to break the enchantment. The maiden seemed to hesitate. Not here. Where, then? I will go to the goblins' fair. Will you meet me there? Yes, tell me of the enchantment so that I may fix the counterspell. The maiden moved slowly away. At the goblins' fair. With a single backward glance, she departed. Shimrod thoughtfully watched her retreating form. From behind him came a roaring sound, as of many voices raised in fury. He felt the thud of heavy footsteps and stood paralyzed, unable to move or look over his shoulder. He awoke on his couch at Trilda, heart pumping and throat tight. The time was the darkest hour of the night, long before dawn could even be imagined. The fire had guttered low in the fireplace, all to be seen of Graffinet, softly snoring in his deep cushion, was a foot and a lank tail. Shimrod built up the fire and returned to his couch. He lay listening to sounds of the night. From across the meadow came a sad, sweet whistle, of a bird awakened perhaps by an owl. Shimrod closed his eyes and so slept the remainder of the night. The time of the goblins' fair was close at hand. Shimrod packed all his magical apparatus, books, librams, filters, and operators into a case upon which he worked a spell of obfuscation, so that the case was first shrunk, then turned in from out seven times to the terms of a secret sequence, 
so as finally to resemble a heavy black brick which Shimrod hid under the hearth. Groffinet watched from the doorway in total perplexity. Why do you do all this? Because I must leave Trilda for a short period, and thieves will not steal what they cannot find. Groffinet pondered the remark, his tail twitching first this way, then that, in synchrony with his thoughts. This, of course, is a prudent act. Still, while I am on guard, no thief would dare so much as to look in this direction. No doubt, said Shimrod, but with double precautions our property is doubly safe. Groffinet had no more to say, and went outside to survey the meadow. Shimrod took occasion to effect a third precaution, and installed a house-eye high in the shadows where it might survey household events. Shimrod packed a small knapsack and went to issue final instructions to Groffinet, who lay dozing in the sunlight. Groffinet, a last word. Groffinet raised his head. Speak, I am alert. I am going to the Goblin's Fair. You are now in charge of security and discipline. No creature, wild or otherwise, is to be invited inside. Pay no heed to flattery or soft words. Inform one and all that this is the man's Trilda, where no one is allowed. I understand in every detail, declared Groffinet. My vision is keen. I have the fortitude of a lion. Not so much as a flea shall enter the house. Precisely correct. I am on my way. Farewell, Shimrod. Trilda is secure. Shimrod set off into the forest. Once beyond Groffinet's range of vision, he brought four white feathers from his pouch and fixed them to his boots. He sang out, Feathered boots, be faithful to my needs. Take me where I will. The feathers fluttered to lift Shimrod and slide him away through the forest, under oaks pierced by shafts of sunlight. Celandine, violets, harebells grew in the shade. The clearings were bright with buttercups, cowslips, and red poppies. Miles went by. He passed fairy shees, black aster, caterline, fear foiry, and shadow thon, seat of Rodion, king of all fairies. He passed goblin houses under the heavy roots of oak trees and the ruins once occupied by the ogre Fidaw. When Shimrod paused to drink from a spring, a soft voice called his name from behind a tree. Shimrod, Shimrod, where are you bound? Along the path and beyond, said Shimrod, and started along the way. The soft voice came after him. Alas, Shimrod, that you did not stay your steps, if only for a moment, perhaps to alter events to come. Shimrod made no reply, nor paused, on the theory that anything offered in the forest of Tontreval must command an exorbitant price. The voice faded to a murmur and was gone. He presently joined the Great North Road, an avenue only a trifle wider than the first, and bounded north at speed. He paused to drink water where an outcrop of grey rock rose beside the way, and low green bushes laden with dark red riddleberries, from which fairies pressed their wine, were shaded by twisted black cypresses, growing in cracks and crevices. Shimrod reached to pick the berries, but noting a flutter of filmy garments, he thought better of such boldness, and turned back to the way, only to be pelted with a handful of berries. Shimrod ignored the impudence, as well as the trills and titters which followed. The sun sank low and Shimrod entered a region of low rocks and outcrops, where the trees grew gnarled and contorted, and the sunlight seemed the color of dilute blood, while the shadows were smears of dark blue. Nothing moved, no wind stirred the leaves, yet this strange territory was surely perilous and had best be put behind before nightfall. Shimrod ran north at great speed. The sun dropped past the horizon, mournful colors filled the sky. Shimrod climbed to the top of a stony mound. He placed down a small box, which expanded to the dimensions of a hut. Shimrod entered, closed, and barred the door, 
ate from the larder, then reclined on the couch and slept. He awoke during the night and for half an hour watched processions of small red and blue lights moving across the forest floor, then returned to his couch. An hour later, his rest was disturbed by the cautious scrape of fingers or claws, first along the wall, then at his door, pushing and prying, then at the panes of the window. Then the hut thudded as the creature leapt to the roof. Shimrod set the lamp aglow, drew his sword, and waited. A moment passed. Down the chimney reached a long arm the color of putty, the fingers tipped with little pads like the toes of a frog reached into the room. Shimrod struck with his sword, severing the hand at the wrist. The stump oozed black-green blood. From the roof came a moan of dismal distress. The creature fell to the ground, and once again there was silence. Shimrod examined the severed member. Rings decorated the four fingers. The thumb wore a heavy silver ring with a turquoise cabochon. An inscription mysterious to Shimrod encircled the stone. Magic? Whatever its nature, it had failed to protect the hand. Shimrod cut loose the rings, washed them well, tucked them into his pouch, and returned to sleep. In the morning, Shimrod reduced the hut and proceeded along the trail, which stopped short on the banks of the River Tway. Shimrod crossed at a single bound. The trail continued beside the river, which at intervals widened into placid pools reflecting weeping willows and reeds. Then the river swerved south and the trail once more north. Two hours into the afternoon, he arrived at the Iron Post, which marked that intersection known as Twitten's Corner. A sign, the laughing sun and the crying moon, hung at the door of a long, low inn, constructed of rough-hewn timber. Directly below the sign, a heavy door bound with iron clasps opened into the common room of the inn. Entering, Shimrod saw tables and benches to the left side, a counter to the right, here worked a tall, narrow-faced youth with white hair and silver eyes, and, so Shimrod surmised, a proportion of halfling blood in his veins. Shimrod approached the counter. The youth came to serve him. Sir, I wish accommodation, if such is available. I believe that we are full, sir, owing to the fair, but you had best ask of Hawkshank, the innkeeper. I am the potboy and lack all authority. Be so good, then, as to summon Hawkshank. A voice spoke. Who pronounces my name? From the kitchen came a man of heavy shoulders, short legs, and no perceptible neck. Thick hair, with much the look of old thatch, covered the dome of his head. Golden eyes and pointed ears again indicated halfling blood. Shimrod responded, I spoke your name, sir. I wish accommodation, but I understand that you may be full. That is more or less true. Usually I can supply all grades of accommodation at varying prices, but now the choice is limited. What did you have in mind? I would hope for a chamber, clean and airy, without insect population, a comfortable bed, good food, and low to moderate rates. Hawkshank rubbed his chin. This morning, one of my guests was stung by a brass-horned natred. He became uneasy and ran off down the west road without settling his account. I can offer you his chamber, along with good food at moderate cost. Or you may share a stall with the natred for a lesser sum. I prefer the room, said Shimrod. That would be my own choice, said Hawkshank. This way, then. He led Shimrod to a chamber which Shimrod found adequate to his needs. Hawkshank said, You speak with a good voice and carry yourself like a gentleman. Still, I detect about you the odor of magic. It emanates, perhaps, from these rings. Interesting, said Hawkshank. For such rings I will trade you a high-spirited black unicorn. Some say that only a virgin may ride this creature, but never believe it. What does a unicorn care about chastity? 
Even were he so nice, how would he make his findings? Would maidens be apt to display the evidence so readily? No, I think not. We may dismiss the concept as an engaging fable, but no more. In any case, I need no unicorn. Hawkshank, disappointed, took his departure. Shimrod shortly returned to the common room, where he took a leisurely supper. Other visitors to the Goblin's Fair sat in small groups, discussing their wares and transacting business. Little conviviality was evident. There was no hearty tossing back of beer, nor jests called across the room. Rather, the patrons bent low over their tables, muttering and whispering, with suspicious glances darted to the side. Heads jerked back in outrage, eyeballs rolled toward the ceiling. There were quivering fists, sudden indrawn breaths, sibilant exclamations at prices considered excessive. These were dealers in amulets, talismans, effectuaries, curio, and oddments, of value real or purported. Two wore the blue and white striped robes of Mauritania, another the coarse tunic of Ireland. Several used the flat accents of Armorica, and one golden-haired man with blue eyes and blunt features might have been a Lombard or an Eastern Goth. A certain number displayed the signals of halfling blood, pointed ears, eyes of odd color, extra fingers. Few women were present, and none resembled the maiden Shimrod had come to meet. Shimrod finished his supper, then went to his chamber where he slept undisturbed the night through. In the morning, Shimrod breakfasted upon apricots, bread, and bacon, then sauntered without haste to the meadow behind the inn, which was already enclosed within a ring of booths. For an hour, Shimrod strolled here and there, then seated himself on a bench between a cage of beautiful young hobgoblins with green wings and a vendor of aphrodisiacs, the day passed without notable event. Shimrod returned to the inn. The next day also was spent in vain, though the fair had reached its peak of activity. Shimrod waited without impatience. By the very nature of such affairs, the maiden would delay her appearance until Shimrod's restlessness had eroded his prudence, if indeed she elected to appear at all. Midway through the afternoon of the third day, the maiden entered the clearing. She wore a long black cloak, flared over a pale tan gown. The hood was thrown back to reveal a circlet of white and purple violets around her black hair. She looked about the meadow in a frowning reverie, as if wondering why she had come. Her gaze fell upon Shimrod, passed him by, then dubiously returned. Shimrod rose to his feet and approached her. He spoke in a gentle voice. Dream, maiden, I am here. Sidelong over her shoulder, she watched him approach, smiling her half-smile. Slowly she turned to face him. She seemed, thought Shimrod, somewhat more self-assured, more certainly a creature of flesh and blood than the maiden of abstract beauty who had walked through his dreams. She said, I am here too, as I promised. Shimrod's patience had been tried by the weight. He made a terse observation. You came in no fury of haste. The maiden showed only amusement. I knew you would wait. If you came only to laugh at me, I am not gratified. One way or the other, I am here. Shimrod considered her with analytical detachment which she seemed to find irksome. She asked, Why do you look at me so? I wonder what you want of me. She shook her head sadly. You are wary. You do not trust me. You would think me a fool if I did. She laughed. Still a gallant, reckless fool. I am gallant and reckless to be here at all. You were not so distrustful in the dreaming. Then you were dreaming too when you walked along the beach. How could I enter your dreams unless you were in mine? But you must ask no questions. You are Shimrod. I am Melanchthy. 
We are together and that defines our world. Shimrod took her hands and drew her a step closer. The odor of violets suffused the air between them. Each time you speak, you reveal a new paradox. How could you know to call me Shimrod? I named no names in my dreams. Melanchthy laughed. Be reasonable, Shimrod. Is it likely that I should wander into the dream of someone even whose name I did not know? To do so would violate the precepts of both politeness and propriety. That is a marvelous and fresh viewpoint, said Shimrod. I am surprised that you dared so boldly. You must know that in dreams propriety is often disregarded. Melanchthy tilted her head, grimaced, jerked her shoulders as might a silly young girl. I would take care to avoid improper dreams. Shimrod led her to a bench somewhat apart from the traffic of the fair. The two sat half-facing, knees almost touching. Shimrod said, The truth and all the truth must be known. How so, Shimrod? If I may not ask questions, or more accurately, if you give me no answers, how can I not feel uneasiness and distrust in your company? She leaned half an inch toward him, and he again noticed the scent of violets. You came here freely, to meet someone you had known only in your dreams. Was this not an act of commitment? In a certain sense, you beguiled me with your beauty. I gladly succumbed. I yearned then, as I do now, to take such fabulous beauty and such intelligence for my own. In coming here I made an implicit pledge in the realm of love. In meeting me here you also made the same implicit pledge. I spoke neither pledge nor promise. Nor did I. Now they must be spoken by both of us, so that all things may be justly weighed. Melanchthy laughed uncomfortably and moved on the bench. The words will not come to my mouth. I cannot speak them. Somehow I am constrained. By your virtue? Yes, if you must have it so. Shimrod reached and took her hands in his if we are to be lovers, then virtue must stand aside. It is more than virtue alone. It is dread. Of what? I find it too strange to talk about. Love need not be dreadful. We must relieve you of this fear. Melanchthy said softly, You are holding my hands in yours. Yes, you are the first to hold me. Shimrod looked into her face. Her mouth rose red on the pale olive of her face, was fascinating in its flexibility. He leaned forward and kissed her, though she might have turned her head to avoid him. He thought her mouth trembled under his. She drew away. That meant nothing. It meant only that as lovers we kissed each other, Nothing truly happened. Shimrod shook his head in perplexity. Who is seducing whom? If we are working to the same ends, there is no need for so many cross-purposes. Melanchthy groped for a reply. Shimrod pulled her close and would have kissed her again, but she pulled away. First, you must serve me. In what fashion? It is simple enough. In the forest nearby, a door opens into the other where, irily. One of us must go through this door and bring back thirteen gems of different colors, while the other guards the access. That would seem to be dangerous work, at least for whomever enters irily. That is why I came to you. Melanchthy rose to her feet. Come, I will show you. Now? Why not? The door is yonder through the forest. Very well, then, lead the way. Melanchthy, hesitating, looked askance at Shimrod. His manner was altogether too easy. 
She had expected beseechments, protests, stipulations, and attempts to force her into commitments, which so far she felt she had evaded. Come, then. She took him away from the meadow and along a faint trail into the forest. The trail led this way and that, through dappled shade, past logs supporting brackets and shelves of archaic fungus, beside clusters of celandines, anemones, monk's hood, and harebells. Sounds faded behind them, and they were alone. They came to a small glade shadowed under tall birch, alders, and oaks, an outcrop of black gabro edged up from among dozens of white amaryllis, to become a low crag with a single steep face. Into this face of black rock an iron-bound door had been fitted. Shimrod looked around the clearing. He listened. He searched sky and trees. Nothing could be seen or heard. Melanchthy went to the door. She pulled at a heavy iron latch, drew it ajar to display a wall of blank rock. Shimrod watched from a little distance with a polite, if detached, interest. Melanchthy looked at him from the corner of her eye. Shimrod's unconcern seemed most peculiar. From her cape, Melanchthy brought a curious hexagonal pattern, which she touched to the center of the stone where it clung. After a moment, the stone dissolved to become luminous mist. She stood back and turned to Shimrod. There is the gap into Irerly. And a fine gap it is. There are questions I must ask if I am to guard effectively. First, how long will you be gone? I would not care to shiver here all night through. Melanchthy, turning, approached Shimrod and put her hands on his shoulders. The odor of violets came sweetly across the air. Shimrod, do you love me? I am fascinated and obsessed. Shimrod put his arms around her waist and drew her close. Today it is too late for Irerly. Come, we will return to the inn. Tonight you will share my chamber, and much else besides. Melanchthy, with her face three inches from his, said softly, Would you truly wish to learn how much I could love you? That is exactly what I have in mind. Come, Irerly can wait. Shimrod, do this for me. Go into Irerly and bring me thirteen spangling jewels, each of a different color, and I will guard the passage. And then? You will see. Shimrod tried to take her to the turf. Now. No, Shimrod, after. The two stared eye to eye. Shimrod thought... I dare press her no further. Already I have forced her to a statement. He closed his fingertips against an amulet and spoke between his teeth the syllables of a spell which had lain heavy in his mind. And time separated into seven strands. One strand of the seven lengthened and looped away at right angles to create a temporal hiatus. Along this strand moved Shimrod, while Melanchthy, the clearing in the forest and all beyond remained static. Chapter 14 Mergen resided at Swur Smod, a stone manse of fifty vast echoing chambers high in the teach tak teach At the best speed of the feathered boots, Shimrod flew, bounded and leapt along the east-west road from Twitten's Corner to Oswe Undervale, then by a side trail to Swir Smod. Mergen's dreadful sentries allowed him to pass unchallenged. The front door opened at Shimrod's approach. He entered to find Mergen awaiting him at a large table laid with a linen cloth and silver utensils. Be seated, said Mergen. You will be both hungry and thirsty. I am both. Servants brought tureens and platters. Shimrod satisfied his hunger while Mergen tasted trifles of this and that, and listened silently while Shimrod told of his dreams, of Melanchthy and the opening into Irerly. 
I feel that she came to me under compulsion, otherwise her conduct can't be explained. At one moment she shows an almost childlike cordiality, the next she becomes totally cynical in her calculations. Purportedly she wants thirteen gems from Irely, but I suspect that her motives are otherwise. She is so sure of my infatuation that she barely troubles to dissemble. Mergen said, The affair exudes the odor of Tamurello. If he defeats you, he weakens me. Then, since he uses Melanchthy, his agency cannot be proved. He toyed with the witch Desme, then tired of her. For revenge, she contrived two creatures of ideal beauty, Melanchthy and Fod Carfilio. She intended that Melanchthy, aloof and unattainable, should madden Tamurello. Alas for Desme, Tamurello preferred Fod Carfilio, who is far from aloof. Together they range the near and far shores of unnatural junction. How can Tamurello control Melanchthy? I have no inkling of how it might be, if indeed he is involved. So now, what should I do? Yours is the passion. You must fulfill it as you choose. Well then, what of Irely? If you go there as you are now, you will never return. That is my guess. Shimrod spoke sadly. I find it hard to join such faithlessness with such beauty. She gambles a dangerous game with her living self for her stake. No less do you with your dead self as yours. Shimrod, daunted by the thought, sat back in his chair. Worst of all, she intends to win, and yet... Mergen waited. And yet... Only that... I see. Mergen poured wine into the two glasses. She must not win, if for no other reason than to thwart Tamurello. Now, and perhaps forever hence, I am preoccupied with doom. I saw the portent in the form of a tall sea-green wave. I must address myself to the problem, and you may have my power perhaps before you are ready for it. Prepare yourself, Shimrod. But first, purge yourself of the infatuation, and there is but a single means to this end. Shimrod returned to Twitten's corner on his feathered feet. He proceeded to the glade where he had left Melanchthy. She stood as he had left her. He searched the glade. No one skulked in the shade. He looked into the portal. Green striations swam and swirled to blur the passage into Irely. From his pouch he took a ball of yarn. After knotting the loose end into a crack in the iron of the door, he tossed the ball into the opening. Now he rewove the seven strands of time and re-entered the ordinary environment. Melanchthy's words still hung in the air. And then you will see. You must promise— Melanchthy sighed. When you come back, you shall have all my love. Shimrod reflected. And we shall be lovers in spirit and body, so you promise. Melanchthy winced and closed her eyes. Yes, I will praise you and caress you, and you may commit your erotic fornications upon my body. Is that definite enough? I will accept it in lieu of anything better. Tell me something of Irely and what I must look for. You will find yourself in an interesting land of living mountains. They bellow and yell, but for the most part it is all braggadocio. I am told that they are ordinarily benign. And should I encounter one of the other sort? Melanchthy smiled her pensive smile. Then we shall avoid the qualms and perplexities of your return. The remark, thought Shimrod, might have been left unsaid. Melanchthy went on in an abstracted voice. Perceptions occur by unusual methods. 
she gave Shimrod three small transparent discs. These will expedite your search. In fact, you will go instantly mad without them. As soon as you pass the portal, place these on your cheeks and your forehead. They are sandestine scales, and will accommodate your senses to irally. What is that pack you carry? I had not noticed it before. Personal effects and the like don't concern yourself. What of the gems? They occur in thirteen colors not known here. Their function, either here or there, I do not know, but you must find them and bring them away. Exactly so, said Shimrod. Now kiss me to demonstrate goodwill. Shimrod, you are far too frivolous and trusting. Melanchthy, as Shimrod watched, seemed to flicker or give a quick jerk of movement. Now she was smiling. Trusting? Not altogether. Now then, even to enter irally, you will need this sheath. It is stuff to protect you from emanations. Take these as well. She tendered a pair of iron scorpions crawling at the end of golden chains. These are named Hither and Thither. One will take you there, the other will bring you here. You need nothing more. And you will wait here? Yes, dear Shimrod. Now go. Shimrod enveloped himself in the sheath, placed the sandestine scales to his forehead and cheeks, took the iron charms. Thither, take me to Irely. He slipped into the passage, picked up his ball of yarn and went forward. Green fluctuations swarmed and pulsed. A green wind whirled him afar, another force of mingled mauve and blue-green sent him careering in other directions. The yarn spun out between his fingers, the iron scorpion known as Thither gave a great bound and pulled Shimrod to a passing luminosity, and down into Irely.